the problem. There we go. And so we should be live. I'm just waiting for the broadcast to come up. Uh, where's Xflit? I think it's a come up. Uh, where's Xflit? I think it's a come up. Uh, okay, grand. Well, are we on? I think that's a sign that we're on. Yeah, I can see us. Um, welcome everybody to this first Trolling with Logic of 2015. It's a very special three hour show. Um, with us is um, Martimer. How was your Hi. Christmas? Oh, the Christmas was okay, but uh, then I got the flu. So, right. yeah, I feel kind of like crap right now. That's, that seems to be going around a lot. And, and back on Ziller, welcome. Hello. And how was your Christmas? I was okay, but I had, I think, Martimer's flu over Christmas, so I've probably given it to you for the new year. Sorry, man. <laughs> and uh, um, a special uh, guest for this hour is actually, this hour is actually my supervisor, my supervisor uh, Dr. Um, Miko Marcini. Hi. And so this is a, so a three-hour show. Three show. The first hour will be That's just... Not. Myself and Enrico will be, dis- be discussing our pr- the the project that is on the experiment.com page and be answering questions. And then the second hour we have Professor Philip Moriarty back on the show once again to discuss science fun- uh, science funding. And then the third one is actually I'm surprised we actually were finally able to get uh, Miles Power from the League of Nerds. And <laughs> and so that is very. L- <laughs> Overexcited to talk to him, as am I. I'm actually quite a fan of his. So, um, uh, sorry, sorry, I'm uh, still uh, I'm still suffering from uh, the Christmas fatigue. So, well, maybe we should uh, start about the actual project itself. Uh, the The project we have is um, is about the is about producing na- metal. N- the project we have is about producing metal nanoparticles, and usually the conventional methods are either expensive or use uh, potentially harmful compounds in there to make these nanoparticles. We take the we take bio- a biological method, which are cheaper, cleaner and just easier to produce. However, there are problems associated with this uh, type of uh, production, mainly that the nanoparticle production is very slow. It takes days to produce these nanoparticles, which adds to the cost, and the nanoparticles themselves uh, have different sizes, which adds to the cost because the, the properties of nanoparticles are dependent on their size. So we hope to add focus to the nanoparticle population, to the nanoparticles produced used by um, the bacteria Shrunella, to by adding in an electrical potential, and we hope to stimulate those that bacteria using this electrical uh, electrical electrical potential to increase the uniformity and increase the uh, and decrease the amount of time needed. At the moment we're about, it takes about 100 minutes as opposed to two days. So it is a, a great uh, decrease in the time. Um, Enrico, would you, do you have anything to, to add to that? I'm just a little bit... Yes, I, want, I, can take it from, I can take it for a few minutes from here. Um, that uh, certain uh, metacontaminated environment uh, and sediments, uh, including deep sea sediments, uh, are able to interact directly with solid surface, uh, solid conducting surface, like uh, heavy metals, sorry, metals and electrodes. Uh, basically, what's happening is that part of the um, energy um, is channeled in oxidation of solid electron acceptor or donor, respectively. Chanel Rodensis is one of these bacteria, isolated originally from le- um, shallow lake sediment in the 80, and is capable of uh, interacting with a variety of uh, um, surface and, um, and uh, material uh, that can use as uh, either an electron acceptor or an electron donor. 
this is a, the general microbiological micro concept. There are various applications for this direct interaction. The first is a bioremediation, aka uh, the bacteria is able to um, reduce or oxidize uh, uh, metal from uh, its, its toxic to less toxic form or eventually to precipitate uh, outside of the water phase. Um, in other case, uh, the bacteria is able uh, uh, to um, perform uh, um, anaerobic oxidation, which are very effective for uh, um, detoxification of uh, um, organic uh, and um, organic compounds. And that's one of the, uh, the applications. That application, uh, although uh, it didn't reach the, the peak that we are expecting, is the production of electricity, production of electricity uh, in a device known as microbial fuel cells. The idea was to convert directly chemical energy from uh, um, low-cost substrate like acetate, lactate, uh, uh, residual um, wastewater and residual biomass into electrical energy. Um, although this, uh, this device didn't, uh, <coughs> didn't scale up uh, to the dimension required for mass production, it is still uh, a very good uh, device to investigate the nature of uh, microbial metabolism uh, um, in, uh, in, and, and for some bioelectrosynthesis pro process. The, the other application, uh, which, is stems, which stems from electrosynthesis uh, um, in uh, Chanel, is the production of nanoparticles. Nanoparticles have been produced for years uh, in biological uh, system, uh, both uh, uh, viable cells and uh, cells extract, because uh, uh, reducing uh, uh, enzyme um, either in, in vivo or in extract are able to interact directly with the metal uh, ions and reduce them to the zero, uh, zero valent form where they, uh, where they precipitate as nanoparticles or various form of aggregates. This is just fine. However, they, there are two problems associated with this uh, uh, biological reduction process and formation nanoparticle. The first process, the first problem is uh, the this side distribution, which is very broad and is not useful for a further uh, application and for down, the downstream processing. The second problem is the uh, long time required for biosynthesis. Early experiment uh, using fungal and bacterial biomass uh, proved that uh, um, using viable bi biomass, the, the reduction mechanism, the reduction reaction occurring uh, 24 to 72 hours, which is way too long for industrial application. Using, <coughs> sorry, using cell extract, the reaction time goes down uh, up to 20 or, or um, 20 or 60 minutes. However, cell extract is expensive because it cannot be, uh, cannot is not more viable cell, so it cannot replicate, uh, and they need to be substituted every time. So the key idea is that. Uh, bacteria are able to interact with electrodes. So we can probably provide a bit of excellent energy in the form of applied potential to facilitate the metal reduction process, which occur either extracellularly or on the cell membrane. That's the idea that uh, um, we started to explore with Michael uh, in Singapore in 2012. Um, we have currently uh, some uh, draft uh, in preparation, and that's why we try to um, push down uh, further this idea uh, in the, on the experiment.com platform and prepare a project that uh, Michael uh, is now supporting. Any other, mm, can you take it from here, Michael, and then? Uh... Um, sure, uh, the experiments to date so far, we've looked at the effect of the bacteria itself. We're looking at Chanel onidensis as compared to Chanel lohica. Chanel onidensis is actually the model organism at the moment, the model uh, organism for electro, uh, sorry, for bioelectricity, at least in terms of Chanel. Uh, but Chanel lohica actually has a faster met meta uh, has a faster metabolism. Therefore, we thought that we would be interesting to compare the two in terms to see if there's actually much of a difference in their performance for the nanoparticle production in the electrochemical cell. We're also looking at the uh, electro material, um, which may be a, which uh, can be uh, an overlooked uh, parameter. Michael, sorry to interrupt you. Maybe we should outline better for the listeners uh, how this process works. You have yes, please, please, because I don't understand the damn thing. <laughs> yes, so like thanks for the feedback, guys. So, Michael, want to start describing uh, uh, how you set up on this experiment? Uh, and then tell basically we see the biological process happening and then we go into further details. Sure. Well, we, first of all, we set up a three electrode, uh, three electrode electrochemical cell. Now, there's three, uh, as the name implies, there are three electrodes, obviously. The first one is the working electrode. This is where the, the magic happens, where we grow a biofilm and where we apply a set potential 
uh, for about 48 hours, and we, uh, which allows the biofilm to form. It uses the actual working electrodes, that, similar to how we use oxygen, as an electron acceptor. There is a counter electrode there that, um, that uh, completes the circuit in the uh, electrochemical cell. And there's a reference electrode. This allows uh, the potentiostat, which is the controller of the system, to basically gauge as a it's a it's a it's a point of reference for the uh, potentiostat that allows the working so it can hold it can fix the potential of the working electrode. Um, okay, but uh, what is the biological process happening here? Uh, you, you want to talk about it or should I a moment? The biological process, well, our hypothesis is at the moment is that when, once the biofilm is formed at the electrode, the working electrode, we can then charge the working electrode at a set potential for about 100 minutes or maybe even less. And basically the electrons we assumed or hypothesized is that the electrons hop from the working electrode to this structure on the outer membrane uh, on the bacterial cell surface uh, which then is transferred to the silver ions now we need to do a lot more experiments to actually demonstrate that this um, model is correct and it may not be but we're just at the very early stages of the actual mechanistic model. Um, maybe if, the, if there's anything else I, I might have missed out, or...? It's working for this, uh, with the system since two years and a half, uh, so I probably tend to assume a lot of things, uh, because it is the, the practical expert of the system. Let's back up a moment and try to make an analogy with the human respiration, okay? We are all familiar with the process of respiration. Basically, we, we uh, use oxygen. We, sorry, we... Uh, we uh, sugar, glucose, glucose, and reduce oxygen to conserve the energy. That in this process uh, uh, allows the maintenance of homeostasis uh, and ultimately uh, our life, okay? I'm doing very, very sim simplistic uh, summary here. Bacteria do something similar. They are able to respire either aerobically or anaerobically, um, by reducing and transferring about the electrons uh, um, uh, You're cutting in and out there, uh, Enrico. Uh, the process of aerobic and anaerobic respiration, where uh, oxidation of a substrate like glucose and acetate in bacteria uh, result into the reduction of a terminal electron acceptor. It can be oxygen in case of aerobic respiration, metal uh, or um, um, soluble uh, um, redox acceptor in case of anaerobic respiration. Start again? Yes, yeah, sorry, but uh, I can summarize just, just what you just said there. Please. Uh, the, in, for, for, um, for human cells, for, for usual, usually for cells such as our cells in our body, we take glucose as sugar and convert that into energy through respiration. Now, what, we, what happens is that we basically start to break down glucose, and which releases electrons, ener high-energy electrons, which then can be used to form what is known as ATP, which is an energy carrier. But through this, you lose energy and give it to the ATP. And at the end, we need to get rid of that electron. Otherwise, just no, otherwise a respiration will stop and we die. That's not good. So basically, that is the role of oxygen. Uh, oxygen comes into the body, comes into the cell to the mitochondria, and is then accepts the electron and then and hydrogens uh, and two hydrogen ions to form water and okay so so what's happened then with bacteria which is the analogy between bacteria respiration and cell respiration that's where our starting point yes the and the in the analogy with that transfers to bacteria as in an anaerobic environment that means without oxygen it obviously cannot use oxygen so it's in trouble now so basically it can 
and has evolved this a little little ingenious little system where it can actually transfer these electrons to other uh, electron acceptors other than oxygen something we don't have that ability to do so it can transfer it to metals such as iron oxides gold silver um, even even quite nasty little metals such as uranium and uh, plutonium this is what that Trinella has done. Trinella is not the only bacteria to do this. And that's interesting enough. Geobacter can also do this process. However, we tended not to use Geobacter because it, if it's exposed to oxygen at all, it's going to die. So it makes, it raises the cost of the whole synthesis and will basically raise the cost of our own, <laughs> of our own lab. And it's quite finicky and not really, not very uh, appealing. Okay, so which is the innovation of the project that you're proposing, Michael? The innovation is that it combines the it combines the benefits of the biological methods, which are that the nanoparticle that which is the method is quite user friendly. That means that each batch is more likely to be consistent as opposed to processes which are can be more complex and then can lead to differences in the, in the uh, nanoparticles produced. Um, the, ca the time is also drastically decreased. Um, from, for Chanela, it's 48 hours, two days, to 100 minutes. And, and uh, sorry, there is one more. And the size distribution can be quite narrow which uh, is actually something we're working on at the moment to try to further increase, uh, further decrease in order to match the conventional methods. Okay, but why, you say that in, in your experiment project uh, that I'm, I'm reading right now, even if I wrote with you, it's okay, <laughs> uh, you said that you are applying uh, a potential, mean, yes. meaning electrochemical potential, uh, potential uh, to these cells. Why is it important to do that, and, uh, and which is the re resulting innovation in this process? The electrical potential actually is the stimulus. It, um, the electrical potential actually allows for an increase in the metal reduction rate. So that means that we're transferring electrons to the metal ions at a much faster rate. This means that the, that the synthesis time decreases and the size distribution of the nanoparticles will also decrease because of the increased uh, focus. So uh, basically what's happening is that uh, by applying a potential uh, we are providing an external uh, um, contribution of energy yes. and since uh, this is a catalytic reaction uh, that results in the creation of uh, a nanoparticle we are uh, facilitating this reaction uh, by adding energy. This can, can uh, on one side, uh, decrease the activation barrier needed uh, for the reaction, which in the case of silver nanoparticles is fairly small. On the other side, can increase the rate. Increasing the rate of nanoparticle uh, uh, formation has an uh, interesting effect on the cell distribution. We tend to have a smaller nanoparticle and, um, and have created much, produce much, much faster. Instead, on the, on the other hand, natural, quote-unquote, um, production of a particle resulting in a wider cell distribution and much slower process, process because the, the goal of bacteria is not to produce a nanoparticle, but just to survive. So with potential, we are providing uh, an additional help for this process. And more interestingly, by changing potential, we might, in the future, be able to determine the cell distribution. So um, ideally, we should tune the potential uh, applied to obtain the distribution that we want for our specific process, be it a drug delivery process or, um, um, or a nanomaterial production uh, process. Okay. And with nanoparticles, the, s the smaller size is better, especially for nanoparticles like silver. Um, is there any questions from maybe our, probably com probably our uh, other hosts? Well, I, I don't really know where to start because uh, I haven't really understood all that much of this. Um, um, sorry, it's um, basically I, what I, I guess I'm uh, wondering about is, uh, I, I, as I understood it, the nanoparticles were supposed to be used for uh, in, in the medical treatments. 
or is it just like uh, you don't really care what they're used for, you just want to know how to make them? Or At the moment we're more concerned with the synthesis and then finding the application. Um, because because at the moment uh, an applica- because at the moment that's what my PhD is mainly concerned about. But yeah. applications can there are applications for silver nanoparticles already um, being looked into, such as silver is actually is a very good antimicrobial agent. Uh, silver can be used for drug delivery and uh, for also for catalytic uh, purposes for in order to speed up slow the reactions. The, but silver is not the only metal we will be interested in or if someone else takes on this project after I'm finished with it and uh, silver may not be the only metal that can be used in this process we could also use other metal na- metals such as gold or um, palladium which have their own um, which have their own uh, applications gold is actually quite a fantastic metal because it's not toxic but uh, it's it's not really it's not toxic, but uh, can have a wide range of um, applications such as um, drug delivery. We can use it to deliver drugs in the body. You can use it in uh, the treatment of uh, tumors. There yeah. are it has uh, applications in electronics, which I'm not really too familiar with. I won't be too familiar with the electronic purposes of uh, these gold nanoparticles. And it can also be used in sensors to in order to t- detect uh, bacterial DNA or tumor cells or um, other other antigens. Uh, Mike, Michael, yeah. Let me uh, interject a moment. Sure. Um, coming, going, going to the question of the drug delivery. Um, when doing drug delivery, it's quite important to have a reproducible material, uh, in this case nanoparticle, so that you attach our drug with a. Uh, very good, very de- well defined geometry, and the drug, the drug kinetic is the same uh, from batch to batch. This usually tended through a very complex uh, uh, standardized uh, um, standardization process uh, in uh, chemical nanoparticle chemical nanoparticle production. This is probably the most imp- the most expensive part, and uh, we think uh, we can save some of this uh, hustle by producing uh, um, nanoparticle which which much more uh, focus the distribution uh, using bacteria. So the main application will be drug delivery or direct application uh, to biofilm uh, infection uh, uh, cleaning uh, of, uh, of um, linen in the hospital and so on. However, prior to this application, which are very interesting but are still uh, far from us, we need to define, uh, which, which you need to understand which is the best, uh, uh, best way of producing a nanoparticle with uh, um, Good, uh, good side distribution, and that's exactly what the what the um, PhD of Michael is about. Once we fix uh, this part and we understand uh, how to produce nanoparticle with the defined side distribution, we can then start, start investigating uh, uh, the application. And uh, Paul is um, Michael is collaborating with Paul Cahill at the CU, uh, which is much more interested in the uh, downstream application, and will be uh, will take uh, the the work from there. Uh, I actually got a couple of questions from chat. Uh, this one from microblogganism. So you are using electricity to increase the number of electrons available to the bacteria's enzymes. Um, can, I ask, can I answer this question? Sure. Yeah, that's uh, about, the, um, about the correct answer, but not only the number, also the energy of the electrons. Basically, by providing uh, additional uh, um, potential, uh, we are providing uh, an external uh, electro- electrochemical driving force which increases the energy of the electrons already delivered by uh, bacteria through their enzymatic chains and so the reaction is faster and results in the production of smaller nanoparticles. Mm-hmm. And there's a second question uh, from a bit of the universe. How do you control the electricity on such small scales? Is this on the scale of transistors in a modern CPU? Is the biofilm coated on something larger? Well, that's an interesting um, question. Uh, at this point, uh, we cannot control the electricity uh, distribution, the potential distribution uh, on a microscopic scale. Uh, our experiment work with uh, uh, an average system, which is an electrode, a uh, few centimeter, uh, few square centimeter wide, and we only apply potential uh, to the whole surface, uh, and we don't care so much about the potential distribution. 
this pressure distribution of the electron definitely will alter the production of nanoparticles uh, in the system. Ideally, we should have a flat uh, microfluidic system where the potential is applied in a much more homogeneous way and nanoparticles are produced uh, from the entrance to the exit of this uh, microfluidic cell. This is quite difficult to scale up and it's also quite difficult to set up for the, for the moment. So we start with this, uh, um, with this simplified system. Biofilm is actually naturally developed on the surface. We are using carbon felt um, and other material because of the large surface and because of the bio bioavailability characteristic. And we can also use other more defined surface like silicon, gold, or other bulk material. However, um, in this case, the current observed in, in the nanoparticle production is so small that we cannot go into further uh, characterization of nanoparticle through microscopy or a spectroscopic method. Okay, let's go on to the chat. Is, uh, I hope this answered this question. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, I think so. Um, do you got, uh, guys, uh, do you have any other questions? Um, not at the moment. No, I mean, my main questions were, I think Marty really touched on it earlier, was kind of looking at what the applications of this will be possibly down the line. I know in your video, um, Kitch, on this, you mentioned things like, you know, things like um, sunblock and stuff, um, which I guess was kind of out there. But, but yeah, what applications you could see coming from this technology further down the line? Well, this will probably be a... This, will, this is more of a, another option for... another option to produce these nanoparticles. Um, but there could be some side spin-offs. Sorry, I just noticed Enrico has gone offline when I've actually become... Uh, what's the phrase? Um, Convalent con term. Ugh when I actually can talk. <laughs> Typical, isn't it? Um, but there are some side projects that could come out of this. For example, Enrico brought up bioremediation, that is the um, basically the removal of, um, from, of pollutants from uh, the environment. One such way we can, one such thing we can actually do is increase the metal reduction rate and Sorry, we can increase the metal removal rate from environmental samples. For example, there are some soils that can be contaminated with metals such as uranium, uh, chromium, um, and, uh, raced water one-off from um, gold and silver mines. You can uh, put that into, we can use this technology to increase the removal rate of those compounds. Oh, it's not compounds, metals. Let's see, Enrico is just dropped out. It's a Singapore connection. That's the one thing they don't have good there is a, a good Wi Fi. <laughs> uh, just looking through the <laughs> chat, Microbe Organism has asked the question where would you naturally find Schwanella? Um, Schwanella you would find in. Um, in, actually, you would find Trinella in the ocean, in um, sea sediment, in the sediments, in ocean sediments. It's a marine bacteria, yes, as a bit of the universe has actually pointed out. Um, Trinella lohica is actually one of the organisms I'm working with. was actually found off the coast of Hawaii. Um, I'm not too sure if you have to start the call back because Enrico said he's back, but I'll just finish this anyway before I, 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 I yeah, start the call again. Um, and in fact, I think Trinella ohica, or some Trinella species of Trinella, are actually found in the intestinal tract of um, of uh, marine life. I'll just be, I'm just going to restart the call just to get him back. And there we go. Hello? Hello? No. Yes, sorry, Ed. 
Sorry guys, this is uh <laughs> See. Oh, there we go. Am I back? Yes. Yes, actually, I don't, wanted know, I don't know how long my uh, religious uh, work um, exposition was uh, heard, uh, but it's okay for the, I'm okay with that. Okay, uh, did you hear the question about uh, where Chanel are usually found? No, but I can answer. Chanel is usually found uh, in sediment particularly sedimented interface between aerobic and anaerobic zones. There have been a Chanel found in Antarctica, Mississippi, uh, Missouri, uh, South America in Argentina, uh, in various lake, and se lake, lake sediment, uh, North America in Lake Oneida, the first uh, uh, they were there found. Um, some of them were discovered in uh, Southeast Asia and so on. I think about 40 locations where Chanel was found so far including the deep sea vent and the 5,000 meter, um, 5, meter uh, sediment. And uh, just, uh, just at this point, I'd just like to remind people that the link to, um, to donate to the, um, to the experiment.com page for this brilliant, uh, beautiful work is actually in the channel description. Uh, it's the first link, it'll be experiment.com project page. So if you can donate anything, or if you're really unable to donate, please do. It's just in the channel description. Um, so actually, I'm not sure if this is a question or not, but I had one here. Uh, now get pumped, link to channel. <coughs> there we go. I see you're, this is from Troll Sar. Uh, I see you're using it as something to build non organic electrical films or particles. Troll Sar, you're emphasizing nanoparticles, metal nanoparticles, uh, particularly silver, though we're hoping that this will be used as a model to build on other nanoparticles or to synthesize new other nanoparticles such as gold, palladium, maybe even if we can get it to that stage we could maybe even look at bimetallic nanoparticles. Definitely not during the course of my PhD but maybe on the, down, further down the line by, uh, by another PhD who's uh, maybe interested yeah, in this. Can I say something about that? Sure. Uh, probably the, this person, I'm not sure I heard the name correctly, refers to the early uh, project for nanoparticle deposition uh, on surface. That was done using viral cage uh, back in the late 90s, and it met uh, uh, some interest from uh, uh, computer um, producers, chip, uh, chip producers, because uh, nanoparticle production on a surface uh, uh, produces a coating which is appealing for uh, a large memory. Uh, however, they are not so small as virus. They are, their structure tend to be less reproducible than virus because uh, we don't have a specific protein cage uh, available like in a virus. And in general, their, their research is still quite, uh, um, uh, quite in, the, in its infancy. The advantage of, of, of bacteria over other more specific systems like virus is the ease of, ease of growth, uh, very uh, low cost of the substrate and so on. We are definitely looking at something uh, mm, like a nanoparticle solution rather than nanoparticle on, on, a, on, a, on a surface. Nanocoating of bacterial origin is still a fairly new uh, research field and I'm not sure how much uh, micro research will impact it. And guys, do you have any more questions about? <laughs> I'm not too sure. It's the mechanism about or her about how this happened. Is that clear? I'm not too sure if uh, if that cut actually through through all the uh, the cuts and my general incoherentness. Well, it, it's probably just that uh, it's above my head. I guess that's the problem. But but I actually do have a question, and it's gonna. I I understand that to you this is gonna sound stupid. But when you produce nanoparticles, uh, 
are we talking about taking like a chunk of metal and breaking it down into tiny pieces? Uh, or is it like picking, finding uh, loose, well, more or less loose atoms in a solution and putting them together into nanoparticles? Or how does this work? Oh, okay. Th that's uh, actually um, that's actually an interesting question. Um, what we're what what we actually are doing is that we are exposing the biofilm to a salt. So basically, it's metal ions just in solution. So we're just basically building it atom by atom, uh, yeah. which is actually in a process known as bottom. Up. It's a pr bottom up process. You can you can go the opposite way and go from the top down and as in take the metal and break it apart using high energy such as lasers but that kind of the, the disadvantage about using that is that you can leave imperfections in the nanoparticle surface which affects the nanoparticles activity and that's not really desirable so that's why bottom up is more preferred to the top down although as far as I know top down people are still working on top down but don't quote me on that. I'm not actually that far into the nanoparticle side of things. I'm still more biotech. Okay, uh, uh, let's say something on this, Michael. Uh, I don't think uh, there is actually enough energy in the battery reaction uh, to uh, bring down uh, metals uh, as the laser do. What is done? What has been done in the past uh, has been the um, oxidation of metal from an insoluble to a soluble state. For example, the famous experiment with manganese done by Ken Nielsen in the early 2000s in his lab in California, where bacteria are able to eat a chunk of solid manganese, which is called manganese... Um, uh, manganese... Oxide. Or, yeah, manganese oxide 4, and reducing it to soluble manganese. So that's actually one of the first evidence of bacterial reduction in the environment. However, the reduction of the of the, the destruction of this material doesn't result into nanoparticle but into ions. So the other process is possible when we take uh, ions and aggregate into nanoparticle together with the aid, and that's a project of Michael, the, with the aid of electrochemical potential. Uh, as you probably know, in the nanoparticle formation, there are two stages. One is the seed part, the, the seed process, and the other is the growth process. In the seed process, few atoms come together and remain together as nanoparticle. Uh, do basically to um, sort of uh, um, random uh, aggregation of, uh, of uh, atoms in, in their insoluble form. After that, uh, the small nanoparticle, few nanometer, grows with time, particularly in presence of capping agents that prevent, uh, that prevent uh, um, how do you say, aggregation of this nanoparticle with other particle. So what we are, what we are working on is a, um, is a, a accelerating the rate of seeding to obtain smaller nanoparticle so that the subsequent growth phase and capping phase where the capping agents of biological origin limit the size of nanoparticle result in a focus uh, small nanoparticle distribution. I hope that this answers your question. Um, if, 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 I, if I could just maybe even just reword it just a little bit. We are hoping to, by increasing the metal reduction rate, to create basically smaller, more, more, a greater number of nanoparticles, but smaller number of nanoparticles, which should bring down the uh, size distribution, or in other words, increase the uniformity of the nanoparticles, so we get nanoparticles that don't really differentiate from each other in size. So we can, it's, if, 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 did I get you kind of summarize that quite correctly, or? Yes. Does it answer your question? I suppose. Okay, uh, fair enough. <laughs> so I just uh, go on to is there any other questions? Um, actually, actually, I've I've an interesting one. Um, you mentioned that you'd mentioned there, Rico, um, ox bacterial oxidation. Um, yes. Is there? I actually brought up in uh, in a blog post about uh, bacterial corrosion. Can you actually use electrochemistry to study how bacteria would corrode um, pipes, such yes, as uh, that's, mortar? That's, that's one of the oldest applications of uh, bioelectrochemistry, 
that dates back to the 80 or even before. And in Singapore, we are now building a new uh, research line in uh, biocorrosion uh, from uh, native marine community. Um, there have been several projects on biocorrosion in the past. Uh, basically, what's happened is that uh, bacteria, uh, as, a, as a single cell, floating cells or biofilm, uh, either protect the um, protect the, the material from oxidation, like any a typical passivation layer, or in certain case, uh, uh, increase the availability of uh, sulfate locally by so resulting in a faster oxidation rate. This effect is quite uh, uh, complicated and it's not clear when the biofilm favor, um, favor oxidation or prevent oxidation. However, there is an effect particularly strong in, soli in uh, salt water. Electrochemistry is a typical method, uh, is a, so far is the best method for this investigation to have the across the rising of local impedance and change into the uh, slope of the tuffel, um, the tuffel uh, plot, which is basically a polarization plot. And these slopes uh, give an idea how much corrosion is increasing with time. Uh, so yes, corrosion is, is quite, uh, quite important for our research. Michael is just, uh, um, the micro project is only tangentially related to corrosion. But in Singapore, when, when I moved a few days ago, we have a, a very strong research line on that. Uh, sorry, sorry, I'm just uh, going through the chat again. It just it won't keep up with me. Uh, just had a, a question here from Bit of the Universe. Oh, okay, that's got it. How are the nanoparticles extracted and stored? Oh, okay. Um, I'll, I'll, well, I can, can I take this one? Please, Michael, go. Sure. Uh, okay. Right. When we produce, after the experiment is finished and we have produced the nanoparticles, they, we have basically now a suspension of bacterial cells, nanoparticles, and what the bacteria has spit out. Basically, Trinella spits out this or secretes this compound known uh, compounds known as riboflavin, or sorry, flavins, which uh, are involved in its electron transfer mechanism. Basically, its ability to reduce or transfer electrons to external electron acceptors such as the electrode or metal ions. So basically we need to separate the nanoparticles away from all that other, all that other stuff. So what we, we basically use a very simple uh, method, it's centrifugation. So basically we can pellet down the bacteria, the bigger, the bigger uh, bac bacteria and the bigger uh, bacterial uh, debris from the nanoparticles by a simple centrifugation, uh, a, 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 well, a relatively slow centrifugation for about 10 minutes. That will leave us with just the nanoparticles and the secreted compounds, these flavins. We then take this, uh, we, take, we take the supernatant or the media, or sorry, the, the liquid that is left over. You'll, when you centrifuge, you'll have a pellet and a liquid top. We take and we centrifuge it again, uh, this time at a higher centrifugation, at around 12,000 uh, times uh, the uh, gravity. 12,000 times gravity, so basically it's 12,000, it, these the nanoparticles become 12,000 times heavier. So they will collect down at the bottom of, the, of our tube. We can then t remove the, the liquid because the nanoparticles are now collected at the bottom of the centrifuge tube and then we resuspend in distilled water. And basically we store at, I usually be cautious, I store at four degrees in the dark because uh, the um, silver is quite sensitive to light. So we need to store this under tin foil and at four degrees just to be absolutely sure because we're not too sure on the stability of these nanoparticles. This is something I'm actually, actually in the mo actually in the middle of doing. I'm actually just waiting for these a few more weeks for these uh, uh, for the nanoparticles I've produced before I check them again to see if they Michael. are of corroded. Michael, I have a question. Yes. All all this, what you are saying is just fine for laboratory practice, but maybe the bit of a universe was interested in uh, asking: uh, Is is there any technique for large scale separation? Uh, of nanoparticles, uh, you think that you know you know something about that? 
as far as I'm aware of, the, um, that's actually something I've been trying to find out, but um, as far as I'm aware of centrifugation, it would be still to probably be the best one. Um, there may be other filtration methods. Uh, actually, well, yeah, let's, say uh, let's say that part of a Michael uh, PhD will be also to determine if we can uh, if we can design a new reactor where we can immobilize uh, uh, newly synthesized nanoparticle and possibly wash uh, them with a single uh, uh, single uh, wash uh, step and we can retrieve uh, them at high uh, at high um, concentration. The problem is uh, to say it's not so much the problem to separate nanoparticles from uh, cellular debris because the, the size is very difficult and centrifugation will work. The problem is how to separate eventually. A nanoparticle of certain sites from other sites without uh, removing uh, the capping agent that prevent aggregation of nanoparticle itself. Okay. Uh, yep. And um, sorry, sorry, just got a bit distracted there. The sorry, so have you have any got any more questions? Um, there was another question in chat um, from Trollzar asking, could you potentially use a two-stage process using the bacteria to generate the nanoparticles until it reaches its size cap, then use a secondary electrical process to build upon the existing nanoparticles? Okay. Michael, are you going to answer or I try to answer? Okay, sorry, and that's, I just want to go back to the original. Uh, there we go. For the bacteria generate in a, in a secondary electro electrical process to build upon the existing nanoparticles. Um, I'm just trying to just kind of process that. Well, at the moment we're actually considering using a the the um, to generate these nanoparticles until it reaches the size, to, until it's finished, and then reduce the size further using an electrical, uh, using an oxidative potential. Uh, but I'm, uh, Enrico, I think you can answer this one better than uh, better than I can on that one. The question is interesting, but um, there is a problem with that. Let's try to let let let's try to explain. We don't want to produce large nanoparticles. That's fairly simple and can be done with any kind of reducing agent, from uh, geranium leaves to reducing sugar to graphene, anything can be re a reducing agent. We want to produce small nanoparticles or, of a focused cell distribution. So the, the electric potential is not, apply, is not applied to nanoparticles large aggregates or nanoparticles, but to nanoparticles application. Maybe the, the, the listener has in mind another application when you produce a, um, they're called a sort of a, a structure um, long distance order nanomaterials uh, through co consistent application of electrical potential. That's an interesting uh, field for nanomaterial production and is used, for example, in computer science, in computer, um, in, um, in uh, silicon technology to produce uh, uh, whiskers uh, and other things. However, our goal is to produce a uh, a variety is uh, produce a, a high concentration of small nanoparticles which are good for biologic application, not large nanoparticles. It's still interesting to combine electrical and biological uh, steps, for example, in a cycle way, and that's a definite a suggestion that we take in. Okay. And actually, I just want to kind of get through the questions because we're almost finished with our hour. Uh, a bit of the universe asks, I'm curious about these Chanel and their ability to be both aerobic and anaerobic. Is this a fairly unique? Is this fairly unique among bacteria? Seems like a pretty significant adaptation. And well, to be the ability to be facultative anaerobic is it's actually not it's not unique to Chanella. Uh, there's another genus um, there's another genus sorry uh, Geobacter that's actually been investigated for their. Uh, 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 for their uh, applications in bioelectrochemistry, but not as, as preferred for our purposes because it is a strict anaerobe, no oxygen allowed. Uh, yes? Maybe, I'm not sure the, the listener wants to, to ask something else. 
Is it normal that bacteria can be can operate both in aerobic and in anaerobic conditions? So, uh, how many bacteria in the world basically are facultative? Well, many bacteria are facultative. However, few of them are really facultative. Uh, facultative bacteria are um, so bacteria can can respire under an, a non a non aerobic condition using fermentation, where the electrons for the respiration are disproportionate between a redox a red and an ox compound. Okay. That's a typical respiration for, uh, for um, uh, E. coli that produces lactic acid as a final electron uh, acceptor and um, yeast that produces ethanol as electron sink. So that's a, that's a common, uh, common mechanism. However, it's much less common to find bacteria that are able to interact with solid surface and are also facultative. Chanel is one of the few that we know. The other one, um, some of, some of some of the sulfur vibrio can be also called facultative and can work under this condition but chanel is pretty much uh, uh, the most investigated bacteria uh, facultative facultative biological bacteria that we know and is uh, pseudomonas is that, uh, is that another two facultative anaerobe because i know that one's actually used in uh, bio for electrochemical purposes yeah but, but pseudomonas is not capable of reducing directly um, a, a solid electron acceptor is, is can do this only through uh, stimulation of production of uh, mediator like phenazines. However, phenazines are produced only under aerobic conditions. We have a couple of uh, paper published in, in Singapore about that. So pseudomonas is not is not really an electroactive bacteria, although it produces redox active compound that can result into energy energy production. Okay, and this is actually I think this is a more of a bit of a. Um bit of a joke actually and this is a bit of a joke but I'll kind of end on this uh, a bit of the universe says sounds like making a multi-layered jawbreaker with a gold core silver mantle and copper crust um, but I anyway, mean that's all our time for this hour we uh, stay tuned for Phil Moriarty who's coming up next to, to talk about science funding uh, I'd just like to thank my supervisor who kindly agreed to join us uh, at this for him, this uh, kind of for him this late hour of being over in Singapore, and um, yeah, uh, stay tuned, guys, and don't forget to donate. And if you have any questions, um, please feel free to contact me uh, uh, through the experiment.com page, or you have, or you'll be able to contact me through the Trolling with Logic website. Um, thanks, guys. Okay, thank you, Michael, for hosting this. See you next time. See you next time. Yeah. Thank yes. you to the others. Bye bye. Bye. Cheers. Cheers. Hello. 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 Well, oh, yep. Sorry. Uh, just going to make sure everyone is uh, around. Hello. Hello. Well, I'm doing the tech today, so expect to be quite buggy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it will, Michael. Uh, well, can you hear me okay? Yeah, uh, I can hear you all okay. Uh, we're just live right now because I'm just going straight through with the three hours, so it just makes it easier to to record and download because I, I'm expecting this computer to bug out at multiple locations. Uh, and you're okay. doing it from the lab as well. Yeah, uh, I was actually just came straight from a meeting so the first hour I was brain fried. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thanks for coming along. Uh, welcome to hour three. Uh, just at this point I just want to remind everyone again to uh, there's the link to contribute to the experiment.com portal at uh, the experiment.com project is actually in the channel description and it should be right below it should be the first link um please feel, please if you're willing and able to do, to contribute please do so so um i think we have agreed for the topic to be uh, about science funding um yep. now with the economic recession at the moment uh, it's quite hard to get funding here in ireland is that the same i would assume that'd be the same in over in the uk yeah, it's 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 much the same. It's it's always difficult to get um, funding. I guess at the moment, 
I don't know exactly the success rate, but I, I'd imagine it's somewhere between some, something of the order of 20%, 20 to 25%, something like that. Um, and I know in Ireland, yeah, I think times are certainly very tough now, particularly for fundamental research. Mm-hmm. And um, and over in over in the UK, there how many? Gov- I know for the gov- for the Ireland here, there's I know of the SFI grants and the Irish Research Council grants. The UK being a bigger country, would it have more more grants available? For- so there are the, the major um, funding of research. Uh, it's very interesting and very complicated over here. We have something called a dual, dual support system, which I'll get to in a second. It can get very tedious and very boring very quickly. But the major way of getting funded, certainly for a physicist, is through one of the research councils. So there are seven research councils, two of those being, for example, the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council. There's also a Biological Sciences Research Council and a Science and Technology Facilities Council. Of long as, as well as the arts and humanities, etc. Um, so they they have the bulk of the funding. They supply the bulk of the funding in terms of research grants. Then you also have charities, for example, like the Leverhulm Trust. You also have um, the Royal Society, for example, Wellcome Trust. There are a range of different funders, but in physics, at least, which is my area, the bulk of the funding comes from the EPSRC, the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council. So I just got to work the tech just a little bit, and that's um. Sorry, just a bit, a little bit stubborn. Um. Oh, just very quickly, Kitch. Yeah. I noticed on Vaughan we can't see. Um, I know that's what I was uh. That that's what I that's what I was just kind of uh, correcting for there. Uh, just for some as reason. As cute as my dog is, I think we're more interested in him. Just uh. <laughs> Don't know about that. Your dog's fairly cute. <laughs> <laughs> and true. And apart from the UK government grants, there are also European-wide grants that you can apply for as well, such as the uh, Euro- Europa. If I got yes. that right. So Europa, I haven't applied for, but one thing I have for there are a wide range of what are called Framework Seven and now Horizon 2020 grants. This is multi-billion euros um, um, across the board, and they fund right across Europe. So Nottingham at the moment coordinates uh, what's called a Marie Curie training grant, which funds PhD students. And the one I'm involved with funds, uh, let me see, 14 different students in six different countries. The um, Marie Curie, in terms of the uh, funding, uh, maybe I should send you the proposal sometime, Michael. It's um, uh, I can't remember. It's off order, 100 pages long. Uh, the, it is very specifically, uh, an awful lot of it is to do with management and an awful lot of it to do with this process rather than the actual science. The science is like a 2 or 3% perturbation on top of the overall management case. And Marie Curie, I would say, is about the best. Uh, there are other schemes were involved in other projects where it's shocking in terms of you have to lay down the deliverables right at the start of the project and then you are you know you have to deliver those deliverables even if the science doesn't seem to be going anywhere you get locked into the delivering deliverables and um, it's a very bureaucratic it's a very short-sighted way of doing science on the other hand there is a scheme called there is a something called the European Research Council which does it right the European Research Council focuses on the science and focuses on overall on the quality of the science the problem with the European Research Council is the success rate is something like, I don't know, 3 to 5%. So it's um, very tricky to get funded. And certainly in nanoscience, when you look at the people who are funded for ERCs, they look to be in the cusp of a Nobel Prize, basically, in many cases. So for us mere mortals, it's tricky to get in there. So I guess, Phil, would that mean that um, trying to do blue sky kind of science is fairly difficult in, in the UK. Oh, right. I could spend, as Michael probably knows, spend the best part of four hours discussing this. Um, in the UK, certainly for the, I'll, I'll stick with the Engineering and Physical Research Sciences Research Council, which is the one I know the best. Um, we now have to, with every grant application, you have to fill in not only a pathways to impact statement, but you also have to fill in a national important statement where 
uh, for pathways to impact, what they argue, what the research councils argue you do is that you should identify the users of your research or the beneficiaries of your research in advance of doing the research and then indeed do to those beneficiaries. That's pretty far away from Blue Skies Research and in fact in the worst case you could argue it's actually counter to the scientific method because if you're doing research to reach a particular target, quite whether that's fundamental or basic science is a very, very moot point. It's closer to, you know, commercial R and D. Yeah. Which is very troublesome. It's something that's um, irritated me and many others quite a bit over the last number of years. Yeah, and it, it seems like that sort of um, environment isn't exactly going to make people find uh, the, the next Higgs boson type thing. Absolutely not. No, it, it forces you to think very incrementally. It forces you to think, you know, what industry is going to be involved with this? Um, what industry is going to be interested in this? Can I push this so I can get some commercialization out of it? What's my intellectual property? All those type of things, you know. I'm not arguing that there isn't a place for that. Of course there's a place for that. And DCU is very good, for example. Dublin City University, which is my alma mater, it's where I did my degree, is very good at connecting with industry, as are uh, many other universities, including Nottingham. But that, for me, is not the fundamental role of a university researcher. The fundamental role of a university researcher is not to act like an outsourced, you know, as part of the outsourced R&D wing of a corporation. It's to do work that's, particularly if it's publicly funded, that is independent and pushes the boundaries. And indeed, you talk to many people in industry and they that's exactly what they say. They said they don't want universities to be doing exactly what um, uh, industry is doing, that there has to be, because they, you know, often they don't have the funding, they don't have the money, particularly in these straightened times, to pursue those type of um, disruptive technologies, if you want to put it that way, that, this type of disrupt, disruptive research. As you can hear, I can get fairly exercised. <laughs> It's, um, um, it, it's something that um, bothered me as well when I was um, picking my career uh, and decided on becoming a teacher instead of a physicist. Um, the whole idea that I, f being a physicist seemed like, I mean, yeah, I would be fascinated to, to you know, get get paid to ponder the great mysteries of the universe and uh, do fancy math about black holes and stuff and and that seems really fascinating but then but then someone comes along and, and says yeah but who's going to pay you to do that yeah it's it's they uh, pay you to, to develop uh, this screw for this uh, engine yeah I, I agree, Tanya, and indeed, in my darkest hours, I very much thought about jacking it all in and, and going off to do teaching myself, actually. But you can still, it's tough, but you can still get fundamental research funded. It's very, it's, I, about nine years, no, about six years ago, I got very pissed off, along with a, no, a number of others, about this whole drive towards impact and particularly the idea that you should let the impact define the direction of your research program, that you should let the, you know, your predicted beneficiaries yeah. or the people you think will be the users define how you do science. And that, that's really uncomfortable. So I actually decided at that point, I'm not going to review any grants. Well, I'll review grants, but I won't review that bit. But the research council said, no, you can't do that. So I stopped reviewing grants. Therefore, I stopped submitting grants. And it's only actually in the last few months that I've gone back um, to and I'm about to actually just click the button before we I click the button on Skype here um, to talk to you. Uh, submitted a, a, a proposal for the first one in six years to the EPSRC, the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, on the premise that they they argue and I'm going to you know do the experiment. They argue that no, we are just as interested as we ever were in fundamental research. Um, and your proposal won't be disadvantaged if you are doing fundamental research. So it'll be interesting to see how this one is received. My pathways to impact, as they put it, and my national importance are fundamentally and solely about public engagement. Because that's if you're publicly funded, I, you know, you have an obligation, you have a duty to communicate what you're doing to the public. 
So yeah. it's biased that way rather than the commercial side. And it'll be interesting to see how the reviewers respond to that. Yeah, and actually, there's always a, a, a there was actually a joke. Uh, actually, I've, I've actually quite heard that if you know that if you get a if an editor gets all gets a reviewer tree to be come back with positive um, but a positive feedback, you know that uh, it's um. Sorry, my my mind is just gone from t- from today. First day back in work. Um, when a viewer, when even when viewer, even when reviewer three comes back with a glowing, um, with a glo- with a glowing review, then uh, you should start to suspect uh, fraud. Uh, yeah, it's it's interesting. It's generally peer reviews flawed. It's you know there's the old cliche about democracy being the best thing we've got, and peer review is is absolutely flawed. We've been, you know, this striped nanoparticle stuff, Michael, we've been embroiled in that over the last couple of years. And um, absolutely, that really brought it home to me um, how flawed peer review can be. And, uh, you know, if you, some researchers, a number of groups have, you know, taken the same set of proposals or the same set of papers and given them to different peer review committees and got dramatically different results. So it's flawed. It's always flawed. And as you say, you can end up with three reviewers, two of which will think it's the best thing since sliced bread, and one will think it's the biggest pile of crap they've ever seen, and vice versa. So it's it's tricky. It's very tricky. And Which is that the same with... That's uh, why your experiment with this experiment... Uh, Sorry, what I was about to say, Michael, is it's why your experiment with this, you know, experiment.com is very, very interesting. I'm extremely interested me almost fascinated with the sort of crowdfunding aspects of this it's it's a really um how can i put it uh, thought-provoking way it's a really how can I, it's, just to see how this pans out into you know i'm not saying that we can obviously fund all science like this but in terms of crowdfunding schemes like this it's okay. clear that they have a role to play i know that's i've i've started this project as uh, just as just as in, out of interest, um, I am actually approaching the the final leg of my PhD. Hopefully, I have if I haven't just uh, shot myself in the foot with that. And um, I'm just hoping to re- receive just the last bit of money, just so I can uh, you know get the, the last bit of disposables and the last bit of money for the metal. As you know, it's a, I'm working with heavy metals such as silver and gold, which. Uh, <laughs> As, uh, as as you know, are very very expensive. <laughs> yes, um, indeed, indeed, indeed. Yes, it's um. So I, I'll be very interested to see how this this pans out because certainly most of the crowdfunding stuff I've seen has been very much targeted on a specific you know product or deliverable. There, although fundamental research has got funded, it's you know it's a much harder sell, much much harder sell. Yeah, and we've actually had a we've actually. Re- had a um, sorry, we actually had a research. Uh, we actually applied for SFI funding uh, for a postdoc, actually, a former PhD student of ours uh, who's actually just gone off, actually, now on a Marie Curie grant to Italy. And and as far as I remember, the actual we got the grant application back, and it was just not enough experiments to do. They said that, that, that the background work wasn't really there. And at one stage, actually, one reviewer actually contradicted himself, and I don't want to kind of go into too much detail about it because I don't want to get anybody in in trouble. I'm not too sure about what I can and can't say about these kind of grants. But it was going through it. I remember just being quite quite frustrated with the the way the the grant works. But sure, that's probably more disappointment than anything really. Mm-hmm. Kind of things. Um. As far as I know, we actually did get a grant approved based on the project we're actually working on now, but for another PhD student who'll be coming in after, after I leave, uh, okay. with so Europa. How long, have you got le- how long have you got left, Michael? Did you say? Six months. Six months. Okay. Uh, probably will probably go. Lo- uh, probably will go over, but I've got money saved in the bank just to keep myself going that way. Uh, it's just the bacterial cell work that I'm actually working on now. It's just in the last legs, but I'm actually working with mammalian cells at the same time, and though that's 
that's that they they take a lot longer because they're more complicated and we're actually developing mm-hmm. a mechanism about how the mammalian cells actually produce gold nanoparticles. This is actually, uh, and then we actually go into a lot more detailed analysis, looking at genetic expressions and stuff like that. And um, that actually is quite expensive. Luckily, that part of the project is being co-funded by another supervisor, but he's only looking after that side of the project. Okay. Uh, because that side of the project is well outside anything we could probably raise on experiment.com. Uh, yeah, yeah. You could, for a mammalian cell project, it cost, you need about 10,000 euro per year. And that just might about cover the cost of media, reagents, use of all that yeah. sort of stuff. And then if no, you have contamination. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I don't think it's widely realized, um, by, if, you know, for those outside the system, and there's no reason why it should be, just how much it costs. So the grant I'm about to put in, which is basically just to fund a postdoc for three and a half years, some travel, some consumables, not a huge amount. When you build in, in the UK, you know, what are called estates costs and indirect costs, effectively overheads associated with that, it comes to, for a three and a half year grant, with one postdoc on it, no equipment, small amount of travel, damn near half a million. So uh, it is quite remarkable how quickly those costs, um, you know, tot up. And then when you think about, you know, the total budget, across all research councils is three billion per year that seems like a huge amount until you you know you work out that you know if if a relatively small grant is half a million it doesn't take so many of them to get to that point very quickly and hence um competition is intense yep and that's all as i say it's all facing me in a six months time well hopefully uh so that's why I thought I. That's also another reason why I went for the experiment.com. A bit of experience. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you're you're interested in pursuing a postdoc and then on to an academic career, or? Um, actually, funny enough, I did get when I was I was actually in ESOF last year or 2000. Yeah, it is last year, 2014, and I went to a career advice uh, booth, and they actually kind of took me through almost a, a step ladder. I actually have it up in the office a time scale first postdoc 2015 fingers it's crossed scary isn't it yeah yeah and then a second postdoc and then actually they advised me to apply under horizon 2020 which i've i actually have kind of that's a bit far away but actually that's actually might be a next question what actually is horizon 2020 because i've heard that a lot a lot throughout maybe conference when i was arranging for speakers as well for the for the biological research society i heard that come up as well for yeah meetings had to rearrange kind of talks around those uh, 2020 uh, meetings. Themes, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, you know what, did you say what is Horizon 2020? Uh, Yes, what actually is Horizon 2020. So the European Commission um, has, uh, in previous rounds, has had what are called its framework programs. So these are huge, basically billions upon billions of funding right across Europe. And it um, has Framework Program 5, Framework Program 6. We're, we're sort of in the end um, part of Framework um, Program 7. So instead of having Framework Program 8, they have a rise in 2020. So it's basically just a, a name for a whole set of different European and Those platforms are very targeted, um, very, particularly, you know, look in nanoscience alone and nanotechnologies, you'll find literally hundreds of themes. And um, and then very specific targets, very specific calls. Marie Curie again is one of the few that allows some degree of um, uh, well, a large degree of flexibility compared to others. So it's it's really just a catch-all term for a large number of European Commission funding programs. And and do you, do you I imagine competition for that is going to be quite unreal. Yeah, I don't know what I so the one I tar- target. I wouldn't, yeah, it's, I suppose it's fair to say I target the one I go for is the Marie Curie side of things. A because there isn't such an intense and stupid focus on research deliverables, and B because the level of reporting um, is much less 
onerous than it is for other schemes. So for Marie Curie, I think the last round for the networks, the training networks, that was something like uh, an eight or a ten percent success rate. So it's yeah, this competition again yeah. is very intense. And I actually Nottingham actually I understand has a higher than average. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Nottingham does, and one of the reasons for that is we employed for a while, um, for a long time, a consultant who actually, you'd send your proposal to him, and he would read over, give you comments, etc. So there was a filtering, a fairly heavy filtering and sifting before it went ahead. Um, so there's that. There's the fact that also UK um, countries tend to, UK applicants tend to do on average a little bit better with uh, Marie Curie than others. Whether that's a language thing, I don't know. Um, and uh, they, yeah, Nottingham in in the UK does does pretty well in terms of, of Marie Curie training networks at least. And Marie Curie is not just just one grant, but it's a there's a selection of different grants under Marie Curie. There's a, yeah, you can have individual fellowships. We've got a couple of people here now in Nottingham are funded by individual Marie Curie fellowships. So these are two years long. Um, and they're really good because they allow a postdoc independence. The postdoc can basically write, or not this can, is expected to write the, the proposal. It's meant to be coming from them. It's meant to be their own independent ideas. So it, it's a good way of um, getting your foot on the funding ladder and supporting yourself for a couple of years. So it's, um, yeah, a good scheme. So it, leaving aside the, the usual uh, qualms and usual moans we have about any type of funding um, scheme. Marie Curie's not that onerous. And, and actually, just I just want to take this point of time to remind people that they can still contribute to the experiment.com uh, project. The link for that is down below. Uh, if you're able and willing, please do. Um, so actually. The, the other, the Marty and Ziller has been awfully quiet uh, over the last few minutes. I just want to, don't want to hog all the the questions. Uh, do you guys, okay, um, you guys uh, have any questions? Not really. Is there? Sorry, I haven't even been. I've been trying to keep up with the chat, but it's kind of gone a bit. Is there any questions in chat? Oh, there's one from a uh, guest. Do you have? Do you find you have to sell your idea? display how, how to make money from your idea or are, are ideas funded based on other aspects? That's a really good question. So um, the advice under some of the criteria for the grant applications, again I'll stick with EPSRC, is um, one of the things that specifically says how might this work um, bolster the economic competitiveness of the UK for example. Um, or contribute to the GDP of the UK, whatever. However, you don't have to go down that route. At least that's what they say. This is. Um, it'll be interesting. I'm just submitting a grant, as I say, which basically forgoes any mention of commercialisation. Um, so that is, you know, is that going to help? I think if you do mention that, yes, this could lead to this commercial spin-off. It might impact on this particular sector, etc., etc., etc. That's the type of thing. That EPSRC, the funding body, really likes to hear. The question is whether you know it's necessary for other academics, um, who are after all the people reviewing your grant, to convince them. Um, is you know, do you really need to mention the commercialisation, or indeed is the commercialisation actually going to adversely affect the chances? Because one thing that's a real problem is that you know you can write two pages. You're expected to write two pages in terms of the impact. You can any academic I think worth their salt can churn out two pages of, of purple prose, fictional purple prose on, on how their particular research is going to change the world. Demonstrating, you know, having definitive evidence or being able to point to uh, you know, hard numbers or hard evidence that actually you are going to have a commercial impact is a, is another matter entirely. So I, I just think the idea of you know arguing that we should have a pathways to impact case. We, sh you know, we should be trying to predict the commercial impact of our work at the proposal stage. It's just stupid. It's just really, really stupid because you end up writing, you know, science fiction basically. You end up writing science fiction. Whether that's entirely necessary, 
is is another matter. You know, the, it is clear that very good fundamental research is still getting funded in the UK. The bias, the skew, is definitely heading towards more applied research, but fundamental research is still getting funded. I, I have huge problems with the system, but you know, I, I, it would be disingenuous for me to suggest that it's impossible to get fundamental research funded. So, not as depressing a picture as I might have painted earlier on. Uh, I know Enrico said when he was uh, in Ireland that if you needed to get, if you wanted to get a research grant funded in Ireland, you have mentioned cancer in it somewhere. Oh yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's um, it's unfortunate, but that's uh, you know the the buzzword. You know, nano to be fair is another buzzword. Um, not so much now, but it's only ten years ago. You know, if you could get nano shoehorned into the title of your grant, it uh, that was seen as a good thing. You know, you can point to graphene now. You know, graphene's going to save the world. So uh, there was a molecule. It was a not molecule, but it was material of the year two years ago, 2012. Oh, probably, correct. probably, and that's not you know, graphene has got some really, really wonderful things about it. Its electronic properties are are very different, very distinct, unique, and unique in the proper sense, um, and um, really fascinating. But is it going to you know revolutionise everything? Is it going to be a panacea that cures every single societal ill? I don't think so. <laughs> and sometimes that's how it's sold. As a as a magic that's a magic material almost that's what that's what i kind of got from it uh from uh some some reporting of it that was just if you got any ailment just put some gra of graphene in it it's uh, like that um quote out of um i said my big fat greek reading the uh window lane <laughs> yeah so it's um it's 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 very very heavily hyped very heavily hyped um and then there's a big bandwagon effect on that, and lots of people jump on the bandwagon, and it's it's sometimes a little bit dispiriting to see, you know, that you know that that bandwagon effect in action, where so many go, oh, there's money there, let's chase the money. It's and yeah. in the UK, is there any particular um, research areas that are have more funded or preferred? to be funded yeah so the, this is another big bone of contention there's something called shape and capability which was introduced uh, a few a few years back whereby many areas including um, surface science which is pretty well my research area was targeted for a reduction in funds so you have different areas labeled um, expand funding maintain or reduce so there were very much um, preferred areas and many of those are increasingly driven by what the research councils think the government wants to hear. Because the research, it's, it's a very interesting, very complicated, very boring dynamic between the research councils and, the, and government. Because research councils are not a government department. It's interesting, they're meant to be at arm's length from government. There's something called the Haldane Principle. There's a huge history behind this, which I won't bore you with. But the idea is that the, the um, research councils should be, um, as I said, at arm's length from government. They shouldn't be jumping to, you know, the government's will. And yet, that's what's clearly happening. They're they're thinking about how best can we um, present ourselves to the government so that we can um, get as much money as possible in the next comprehensive spending review in the next budget. And you know, in one sense, that's laudable. They're trying to get as much money for science as possible. But the question is. You know, what are you giving up to get that money? What are you selling? You know, in terms of integrity, credibility, and supporting fundamental science. So there's there's a huge debate about this going on at the moment, of course, because we've got a uh, an election coming up this year. It's going to be an even more intense debate coming up for that election. <coughs> I'm afraid, Michael, I'm going to have to. Which I, th I hope I told you, email. I'm afraid I'm going to have to go in about five minutes' time. Uh, sure, no worries. Um, uh, I'll be able to fill in. I'll be able to to, to fill in the fill in. Sorry, yeah, no, no, no worries. Yeah, I got the email. Okay. So yeah, I've got something to to fill in that. But um, sure, I, I'm, uh, guys, do you have any questions? Because I feel like I'm just kind of just keep keeping this, you know, being not take more than my fair share of the 
the time. <laughs> I, know, I always have lots oh. of questions in my head when Bill Moriarty's on, then suddenly I get the chance to ask them, they all just disappear. I'm going to have to write them down one day so I've got them all in front of me. Yeah, then, then there, there's a chance uh, one might go completely off topic when one has a, a, a physicist to play with. <laughs> we had our, uh, uh, Zeller, we had our little problem that you brought up to me that uh, with the, the light thing. Weren't you arguing with flat earthers or something, and, and that's where it came from? Like, how f if if the Earth were f uh, just a, a flat plane, uh, would you be how far would you be able to see? Yeah, at what point would the atmosphere appear? I guess, for want of a better term, opaque. At what point does atmospheric extinction extinguish all visible light? Um, at what point. distance that happens? You know what? I don't know. Was a very, very interesting question. Um, off the top of my head, I really don't know. Yeah, we it, light is a really strange thing, and light's interaction with matter. You know, that's what Feynman won his Nobel Prize for. So it's a pretty tricky concept, and a, you know, lots of even looking through a piece of glass. So much physics, so much physics mm. going on there in terms of you know something that's apparently transparent, but then what's happening at the surface in terms of the reflection. What's happening in terms of refraction? It looks like the light goes through unimpeded, but of course it's not unimpeded because other, otherwise you wouldn't have refraction. What's happening at the quantum level? What's happening at the wave level? It's a really fascinating aspect of that. But to answer that question, I'll go away and have a think about that. <laughs> but, um, in terms of the absorption it, it, and the scattering, it exactly. It didn't sound like it should be that much of a problem. That, well, it's interesting. We, we all kind of know what goes in there, but how do you actually calculate? Yeah, well, you'd have to think. That, uh... Right, right. So first of all, there's a range of different. So, so with any optical problem, you're going to have a wavelength dependence in terms of the absorption and the scattering. So you've got to think about what that wavelength dependence is, because that will change your effective extinction coefficient, or whatever you want to call it, depending on wavelength. Um, then you've got to drill down. Is it actually absorption or is it scattering? Um, then is it scattering due to sort of me scattering or rally scattering, or is there some type of Raman process occurring? Um, and if it's absorption, what type of absorption is that is? And then re-admission um, in terms of the you, you might excite an, a, an atom or a molecule to a particular um, excited state. How long does it take for that state to decay? What sort of wavelengths are you generating in that process? A huge numbers, huge numbers. Which generally, what you do as a physicist is trying to, to you know bring these all together, all this physics together into one simple number, which is like a decay constant. But the physics behind those decays constants are, are really, um, really quite um, complicated. And I'm afraid on that particular note, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to leave it because my wife's working tonight, so I really need to get home okay. and start looking after the kids. Okay. It's a pleasure as, you, yeah. as ever. Grant, sorry, just have See you later, Phil. See, See you then. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Oh. Um, but I actually just have a question for, for us. I don't, th I don't think... Um, Sorry, I have a question from Trollzar anyway. So, have you guys heard of Gridcoin.us? It's a cryptocurrency similar to no. Bitcoin. Uh, I haven't heard of it. I think it's a bit mm, obscure. Sorry, I couldn't ask Phil, but um, no, that's that's just a that's just live broadcasting. Um, so anyway, there we. Uh, I'd like to take at this point to remind people they can still donate uh, or contribute to the experiment.com page. Uh, it's link in the description. We do have uh, a donation from... Uh, actually, I'm just going to check my email because I've, uh, I've lost it. Sorry. From microblogganism. Thank you. Thank you for your donation. Um, so, how can we fill in between now and, um, and actually, I'll t you know, I'll take questions for about the, the project, maybe there's something that wasn't really explained well that can happen because, as I said, I did come into this a little bit brain fried from a, a lab meeting that went on far too long than I had to for the first day back in work. 
Um, so, is there any possible? Is there any questions about what the, what the project is about? What's the science behind it? What's the application? Um, what's the mechanism of how this is happening? Um, actually. Um, uh, the bacteria, the nanoparticles guessed, will it blend? Um, possibly. If you get, if you don't, if you're willing to donate money, I will answer that question. <laughs> I will do the experiment to prove that question. There's that, there's your money at work. I'll find out if the nanoparticles will blend. Um. So I, I wish I even had. I wish I, uh, this had didn't occur on the first day, but you know I didn't want to leave it too late. Uh, because I'd have you know an electrochemical cell up and running and be able to show that off. Um, I do actually have the bacteria up and running. Actually, I came in yesterday. I'll be back in a second. I was hoping Ditch might give us a tour of his lab at some point. Uh, I would, but literally I would need to unplug the laptop, and the battery doesn't work in this laptop anymore, so as soon as I plug it out, it dies. Damn. But actually, what you can see here is actually my bench space. This actual lab bench, although there's no point in saying it's my lab bench anymore, because I'm the only person left in this lab for the moment. Uh, yep, I'm all, uh, here on my own in this lab. <laughs> But, um, what does that say about you, Kitch? <laughs> that, oh, I'm just... I'm, d I'm just not a nice person. <laughs> but actually, as you can see here, um, I actually meant came in yesterday because I have no life, and I s took a bacterial cell up. Basically, when we store bacteria, we need to... Oh, yeah, I need to put my window on larger. How do I do that? How do I actually make myself larger? Don't... Nobody... Did that work? Not too sure. Um, I want to do a study on this because every time I've seen one of these live hangouts or something like this on Vaughan TV, it seems the more scientifically minded the person doing it is, the less technologically able they are. I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> um, well, anyway, yeah, when we store bacteria, basically you can't have bacteria out all the time because they'll accumulate so many genetic changes and you won't be able to use it anymore. So basically we store them in stocks at a temperature of minus 80. That means that the bacteria just doesn't, um, doesn't grow, it doesn't metabolize. And you also add in a bit of glycerol so that basically prevents crystals from forming, ice crystals from forming. And that can damage the cell if it's formed in the cell because it'll start bursting the membrane and leaking out all the bacterial guts all over the place. So I mean, this is actually what I have in my hand, a culture of Chanella. Now when they, I took this out yesterday, so the culture isn't that active at the moment. It needs a little bit of time before it can actually get back into the full swing of things because minus 80 is quite harsh. So it's going to take a little bit of a while for the bacteria to grow. But I, what I hope you can see there our bacterial colonies on this plate, I assume. Ah, uh, yeah. And basically, this well, is I a. I hope that's what it is because I think you can get banned for. <laughs> ah, it's. <laughs> yep. No, no, there are not lines of uh, illicit, of an illicit substance. <laughs> Not yet. Um, basically, you can see here that the color is orange. Basically, what, why that this co colony is orange is that on this LB egg, it's basically what's well, known as an LB egg or plate, but I've added in iron, about one gram per liter of iron. And the bacteria basically uh, produce iron oxide, and that gives you the, the, uh, the orange color, or the iron oxide is rust and also yeah it, it smells because you know bacteria they, they're, they're, they're smelly and they 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 don't like to be added to <laughs> minus eight minus but well, they, they they can usually do well but i'm going to put these back anyway just so i don't forget about them 
Be back in a second again. Oh, and uh, yeah, and since my supervisors are not looking, I do have these. That's actually gone a bit off colour. That's actually good. Okay. I do have bottles of wine in the lab, basically from the old, from the last PhD moving. Had a bit of a celebration, and the lab mascot. Barry, the sheep. I was going to say, the wine's not part of an experiment then, Kitch. Mm, maybe at the end. Uh, you can probably guess the experiment. <laughs> um, and... Oh, actually, I do actually have samples of, of gold. Here, actually. See, these are actually on a related project. I basically take the surface proteins from uh, a fungi known as Rhizopus, uh, isolate them and incubate with the gold salts for about 48 hours, and then the fungal proteins r produce these lovely nanoparticles. And different types of rays that you... I actually, what we found that the way that you isolate the proteins from the fungi actually influences the nanoparticles produced. Um, I hope this isn't turning out into just absolutely dry, plain, boring filler between now and when Miles finally arrives. Um, actually, hold on. I think I think I know how to. Actually, oh, I made a serious, serious. Uh, um, error or flaw here. I will... Now my mini! Oh, hello! Oh no, we've got him. Fear me and obey. <laughs> it won't be a troll number logic without Angry Pumpkin. Of course, I'm the nicest, kindest, most polite person in the universe. And now that I've stopped lying like a politician on crack... Happy New Year, you bastard. Please don't remind me that it's the New Year. A it new just year. Makes me think that I missed, I missed out on opportunities to get drunk last year. Or maybe opportunities to get drunk this year. I like your optimism. Now, please tell me what you're doing, because I have no idea. Uh, well, Phil, uh, Phil had to leave a little earlier, and Miles couldn't actually be join us until six o'clock. So we're just filler. <laughs> Uh, we have a quick question from guest 264 who wants to know if Marty can see his chakras. And I will dignify that with a response. <laughs> Assume that means yes. Well, I will answer the question. <coughs> guest 264, I can't see your chakra, but I can see your penis. Please put it away. And just wait for the awkward silence to fall. I have literally no idea how to respond to that. <laughs> no one ever does. Uh, so, any other questions from the chat uh, while we are waiting for... Oh, actually, uh, Miles is online. Uh, so I'll be back wait. in just a quick sec. I have a question. Shoot. How do you science? <laughs> With a spoon. Good answer. A wooden one. The constant heavy breathing from Kitch is making me think I'm involved in phone sex again. <coughs> 
Okay. So 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 yep, uh, Miles is here. So we're just coming. To, I'm just going to start the segment early. So uh, reminder, guys, just link down in the doobly doo description to donate or contribute to the uh, experiment.com. I actually forgot to mention that if you do become a contributor to the project, uh, you won't actually be billed until the project actually reaches uh, the target. So if you donate and the project doesn't get funded, you will get the money back. You won't actually have, you won't actually contribute anything. And if you do actually contribute and the project does go ahead, you will gain access to lab notes that I post online. I'll be posting uh, updates about the research. So basically you will find about how the research is going before anyone else, before publication, when the publication is out, and, me, and uh, probably other amount of other goodies that I will uh, be able to think of that I can do. Uh, if you guys have any actually any other up, any other if you guys have any suggestions about treats or little things that I can do to encourage people to donate or contribute, please do let me know. Uh, I was wondering if you know if we donate a certain amount, do we get a credit on the paper? Um, that I'm not actually too sure. Uh, I think you might get a mention if you donate a certain amount. I'll actually have to cons I can confer with my supervisors on that one. But can we set up things that if people don't donate will kill them or severely hurt them because extortion works I think that's illegal in my country but you know what I think it's legal there so work in away Northern Ireland it's just a way of life in Northern Ireland car drives you no in Northern Ireland car drives over you <laughs> Touche. I will we'll be back in a second with uh, Miles, so talk to you then. Hello. 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 Yes. Hi. Sorry, we're we're going straight through live uh, because I'm doing this on expert and I don't want to kind of break it all up and make an absolute nightmare because I'm afraid my laptop is actually going to break down at and at the sign of any bit of difficulty. Oh gummy. It's one of those kind of different it's one of those kind of difficult laptops. <laughs> uh, oh, <God> face. Oh. <laughs> How are you doing anyway? You alright? Yeah I'm doing okay. Just a bit brain dead at the end of a first day. I actually had a, a lab meeting and everything that went on way too long. <laughs> I know what that's like. Okay, so uh, hi guys, welcome to the third hour of the f of the uh, third and last hour of this um, trolling with logic uh, special. Uh, I'd just like to welcome our guest Miles to uh, the show. Hi there. And hello. Hi. That's right. And uh, Martimer and Ziller as our co-hosts. And. And the topic we actually are discussing is bad science, isn't it? And and sorry, sorry, I'm just miles away at the moment. Bad science and dealing with homeopathy, anti anti GMO, and sorry, sorry, I'm just everything's coming in at once at the moment. And of course, so yeah, anti-GMO and anti-vaxxers. Cool. Where do you want to begin then? All right, well, maybe we should begin with, I think, anti-vaxxers. I think that's may maybe probably the kind of the most uh, probably the one mo most people will be fami more familiar with with the bad science campaign around uh, on this channel, the anti-vaxxer movement. Um, what uh, probably a good question to ask? What kind of brought the anti-vaxxer movement to your attention, or what's made you decide? What, 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 you made videos about the anti-vaxxer movement for. What kind of what kind of inspired you to make videos about that particular brand of uh, pseudoscience? Well, it was actually the uh, the first video I ever made was um, an anti. Sorry, get my camera sorted here. It was actually the first video I made uh, was one uh, bashing people who were against vaccinations, and I guess it really comes from when I was at university. Uh, mumps 
was a serious problem uh, in Manchester. We had entire halls of res that would just be, you know, all infected with mumps. And this was crazy. This was back in like 2006, 2007. Uh, and it, it's a disease that really shouldn't be affecting as many people as it was. And then um, I knew that uh, in the news, a lot of uh, stories have been about anti-vaxxers, but I always thought there were a very small number of people. It wasn't until it became such a massive problem in Manchester that I was like, oh, I'll read a bit more. Uh, and also, uh, I was going into too much detail, but I, I, was, I know someone very close to me who was affected by it. So, yeah, I really had to be under my bonnet about anti-vaxxers. I mean, it's something, I, I always say there's something very almost lazy about certain people who, who, I know it sounds awful, but it's kind of true, who don't look into detail about stuff. They've heard that vaccines are bad off the news and whatever, and they won't go any further. They won't talk to their GP. They'll just say, no, they don't want to take the risk because they don't see uh, polio anymore. They don't really see mumps and measles until, well, like in, I guess, was it 2013, where suddenly measles came back and then we had scares, particularly where I'm from, which is in the northeast of England, a place called Middlesbrough. It was the place that was uh, pretty badly affected that in North Wales, here in North Wales. So yeah, my, my first video was on it, actually. Um, it was a, it was from a guy, it was about a guy who, who was from Birmingham who was saying don't get your kids vaccinated, and he had 4,000 viewers, I think, and at the time, that was like a phenomenal amount of people, mm. and I thought, fucking hell, I have to do something. Oh, can I swear, by the way? I just realised. <laughs> oh, no, it's okay. Oh, yeah, go for it. <laughs> oh, wait, we, we've uh, long foregone any, any, uh, any no swearing laws, uh, any no swearing policy on this show. Awesome. So. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'll try and cut it down anyway. I get told off for swearing, like, by my mum of all people. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, so yeah, I made a video where I basically called out everything that he said. He was going through the lists of uh, ingredients that were in vaccines, and he was saying, look, this is just awful. Um, and I went through point by point, uh, being really quite anal, discussing every single one, saying why he was wrong, why it was in there. And I uploaded this video, thought nothing of it, and then I checked back a couple, few weeks later, and I couldn't find his original video. And I was like, oh, where's it gone? And then I found, because it was back in 2010, they used to have a sidebar where you could describe what, you, describe what your channel was like. Uh, and I found out that he wrote something on the lines of that he's changed his views on vaccinations. I was like, oh, bloody hell, that's fantastic. You know, there's real power to change people's minds here. And that's really where I started on YouTube. But yeah, anti-vaxxers, they really, they do annoy me. Because I find myself arguing with people in the pub all the time about it who don't get their kids vaccinated. And I'm like, please, honestly, it's totally worth it. You know, when they're 20 and they don't have to worry about measles, mumps, and rubella and all this kind of jazz, they're really going to thank you. Uh, otherwise, you know, if they get infected by one of these, you know, you, you can almost say goodbye to grandchildren and stuff like that. It's, it's They're not nice things. Mm. Yeah, that's really a, a bit of a particular reason why I don't really like the anti-vaxxer movement because it doesn't really affect m m the adults it's more of the kids that are that are going to be feeling the the brunt of this the kids of the anti-vaxxers and mm. not really the adults themselves uh as well you said, it's not just them that's the thing as well people uh we don't live uh, people presume that we live in a perfect world where everything is going to work 100 percent of the time it doesn't vaccines do do not take some times and also we have people who can't be vaccinated because of medical reasons so by getting your kid vaccinated you are protecting them yeah, uh, yeah. To... I think that's that's the big thing, isn't it? That by not vaccinating your children, you're also putting other people's children at risk. Mm. Um, I think that's the thing that probably annoys me the most. Although obviously <laughs> neglecting your own child's care is bad enough, but to then neglect the care of the society around you is yeah, it's mm. very dodgy. And uh, this whole. As far as I as far as I read into it, it really kind of kicked off this new anti-vaxxer movement through uh, Wakefield study, uh, which has been a ter oh, absolutely <laughs> yeah. Uh, that, that's, yeah, no, that, that's, was that's that an found awful. To be fraudulent. Or yeah. Was it just yeah. Bad. Yeah. No, it yeah. was fraudulent. He made up data, didn't he? I think. Uh, he tweeted to the point where it's not really recognisable. So you can tweak and you can say things, and if you're not, uh, I, I think Concordance did like a fantastic video on it before, where he was looking at PCR. Uh, he did something there, and he said like, "This is the same. You can tweak it past the point where it actually is what it originally was," and that's what he did. And he also uh, uh, made these kids go undergo procedures that were totally unnecessary. 
so he got he got absolutely smacked down for that. And also his paper is a lot of people haven't even read his paper. It, it says in black and white that it they haven't shown a link between autism, certain bowel uh, problems, and vaccines. It says it's like a very preliminary one. It wasn't until the the press conference where they actually said they found this link, and people seem to remember that and forget the paper. Yeah, but that's really that's the kind of the key. Um, that's really key for any really pseudo science that cites a peer review paper is that generally they haven't read it uh mm-hmm. such as the uh that famous anti-gmo paper by solani uh oh, which no. uh <laughs> the roundup one yeah, yeah. But, uh i remember re- i remember reading that and oh, i just i was i've never felt such a conf- weird confusion of absolute rage and confusion because i it's it's just really this is the paper that people are citing no and there's also other papers as well like that have been cited by creationists um that don't say what they're saying or they might read the abstract get a gist of what it says and then says oh this supports my idea which if you actually read the paper it honestly doesn't should i tell you who's the absolute oh sorry i was just gonna say the worst people I've found for that are geocentrists who jump on things about cosmic microwave background radiation and they, um, they're talking about the strange axis of evil, the diapoles that are all supposedly aligned even though they're, they're not. And they do that exact thing, they just pull out things from the abstract, put it up and say there it goes, it proves my point. And you read through the paper and you go, actually they're saying the complete opposite to what you're saying. Um, People don't seem to read the papers that they're they're citing half the time. Yeah, it's true. It happens all the time. Uh, uh, wh- I mean, I made a video a few a while back about one looking at BT delta endotoxins, where it said that it'll cause leukemia, and then you look at it, and it's not specific for BT toxins; it's for the bacteria. And you think, well, it does completely different things. Uh, I once had a guy give me a paper talking about. Uh, the money money side of getting people circumcised um and i read it and i was like okay i i don't really care about the money side of things that's really to me irrelevant it's all about you know you could argue eugenics from that side and that's not well extreme eugenics uh, from that side and he's like oh no no you're in a, you, you're just reading the conspiracy you're just thinking it's all about money it's not about money i was like you just sent me this fucking paper <laughs> you know this is the paper you've sent me uh i, I took the time to read it read it uh, actually i actually responded to an e video quite recently where he um, actually takes a new scientist article that says that reports on a recent discovery on, well, I'm not sure how recent it was, I can't remember the actual year it was published off the top of my head, but it was on XDNA. A new scientist had a little paragraph where they said, oh, this might, uh, this might uh, help us to understand what early life might, might have been like, or this um, might help us to understand what life might be like in the uh, outside of our planet, and he had taken this this little piece by new by this little this like this little paragraph by new scientists and blew it up to say that the scientific community believes this discovery is uh, proof that um, yeah that uh, this discovery proves that you know life you know. That we can they can prove abiogenesis and that life and you know basically made about abiogenesis. But if you actually read the paper, they never made any such claim. They it was only really the, about the rec- about reporting about um, how they actually made this this molecule. Uh, the best ones have to be the ones that go and quote uh, undergrad research and say that hey you know scientists believe this and you go back and you're like oh no this is just you know a third year. BSC student who said this. <laughs> oh, no, the scientific community totally are behind this person. All right. Not saying that you should flat out dismiss any undergrad research. I wasn't slagging anyone off there. Sorry. Uh, I I'd, I'd hope my I hope my undergrad research wouldn't be out there. It's, you know, it's a basic, very uh, kind of basic research. That's crap. Now, you, you notice a, a really huge difference in quality between just. Uh, um, the bachelor level and the master's level. Yeah. And then I just it's know, like when I, I compare my master's thesis to my bachelor's thesis, it's I mean 
you can tell there's like two years of development between them and that's still nothing compared to what a PhD scientist would would write. Uh, but then there's a, there's a whole lot to go in there um, between bachelor level and a masters and in just in terms of writing. That's actually one one of my biggest uh, pitfalls. But um, sorry, I think we're going off on a bit of a tangent on that one. <laughs> uh, so that's the actually select. What I've also noticed about pseudoscience is that they tend to use um, very questionable sources as well from sources that are not t intended to be scientific authorities, such as uh, the Daily Mail or, it's, you know, well, that's an absolute authority on crap, but, uh, you know, popular science magazines and saying that this is what this, that, this is what the scientific community believes. Yeah, creationists love the National Geographic, don't they? And... Uh, now on the age of the internet where anyone can write a blog, uh, you know, usually people just quote blogs now, who quote other mm. blogs and other blogs and it turns into some massive circle joke and quite often there's no uh, recognisable research at the, at the end of it, I've found. It's a fun little game though, <laughs> to try and track it back to its source. Uh, for, sorry. The... Sorry, I really need coffee at the moment. I, I, I never go two hours without coffee. That's a general rule when you're in science. Um, yeah. The what I actually noticed myself actually was when 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 I was actually going through one of the uh, I think it was science, one of the scientific databases. I think it was Web of Knowledge. Is that some of those databases actually have a homeopathy journals as well. Of course, there's only really one that I know of that's science. I'm not sure my quotation marks are being seen there because I'm actually very tiny on the on the monitor. But I, I, sorry, I have no idea how to fix that. Um, are there? Uh, how would you be able to tell for a layperson? What what would be a good reputable source from a disreputable source? Something that's you know had to separate the good science from the, the bull crap. I get this question all the time, and unfortunately, you, there's no answer to it. You have to know your field. You have to know what you're talking about to be able to decipher it. I mean, it's like if I were to jump into uh, computers or engineering, and I looked at some research papers around there, I just wouldn't have a clue where to start. I mean, I know probably to ignore the ones that say that the earth is hollow and that gravity doesn't exist but like <laughs> apart from that I wouldn't have a clue where to start so you really need to know what you're talking about unfortunately th there's no easy answer you just need to be able to get your teeth stuck into it unfortunately and um, <clears throat> and I, that, that's what I very really, very really agree because Science is just can be very methodical, very precise in its language, and very. Then there's a lot of can be a lot of jargon, but it's still necessary jargon that can put off a lot of people who really won't be into that field. Even different fields of biology, uh, you can by, by be able to confuse. Um, for example, I won't. Uh, for example, I won't be able to go to a genetics paper or, so, or a paper on bioinformatics that easily. Whereas yeah. someone I tell you what I love. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Have you guys yeah. seen the cartoon that's going around now that says like movie scientists versus actual uh, yeah. scientists? And they've got uh, one where it's kind of like uh, the movie scientist is like, oh, well, I'm an astrophysicist, but I can read this genetics paper and get you your dinosaur in a couple of minutes. And then it's like, oh, the real person's like, I'm a microbiologist and this is this paper's on bio whatever. I'll better ask someone. Because, <laughs> yeah, honestly, scientists are incredibly specialized. I mean, me and James uh, on, on a podcast I do called League of Nerds, uh, we always say that it's a, a special trope. We call them doctor scientists because they just turn up and they know everything. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay, I think I loved, there's a, a video you did not so long ago, Miles, where you actually asked, was it James, a few <laughs> questions on chemistry, and he was just hopeless at almost I, everything. I felt so bad. Like uh, he, he was also really hungover, bless him. Uh, <laughs> we had two nights on the trot, 
Uh, mm. But I'm really hoping that I don't ask any biology questions. He's going to spring it on me one of these days, and I have so many people being like, "You're a dick for doing that," <laughs> but he's going to do it. I know, and I'm just going to look like a fool. Uh, oh. I deserve it though, to be honest. To be fair. Uh, that could be a fun little drinking game. <laughs> <laughs> every every question you get wrong, shot. At least at least you'll uh, enjoy the the experience. Um, sounds, sounds like a good game. Uh, I uh, don't be giving them uh, these guys ideas. <laughs> you know the the tip of the, the 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 fun game for them is get the Irish person drunk. <laughs> um, actually, just on the doctor scientist, uh, actually, I've heard, uh, actually, uh, there's actually one person that I um would be more familiar with. Uh, have you ever heard of John Pender Pender Pendergast or what's his Pender Pender Pender? God, I can't pr- pronounce the second name. He's a creationist, but he's also but he's claiming that he's a chemist, even though he is a auto mechanic. Pendleton. Ham- no. ha- yeah, yeah, he's Ooh, a Pendleton. Pendleton. Yes, John Pendleton. John Morris Pendleton. John Morris Pendleton. Oh. That's where the Pendleton. Pendleton. Yep. Tell me more about this guy. Uh, go on then. Uh, he actually Logic actually did a, a thirteen-part series. Um, I'd recommend watching, uh, but basically he appears in. If I actually could get my lab coat, I could probably do an impression, but uh, <laughs> I'll probably leave it for the moment. If, if uh, guys, if you can donate, let's say donate maybe twenty euro to the people in the chat. If you donate a certain amount of money, I will get my lab coat and I will do an impression <laughs> of John Pen- Pendleton. But uh, basically, he's an auto mechanic who basically does a creation seminar. Seminar. I actually, I actually prefer to keep, leave respect for the word seminar or conference. Yeah, he, uh, he, uh, he has not understood what a seminar is. Yeah. He just stands in front of a camera and talks. Because I, it's a sciencey sounding word, and yeah. he calls himself scientist chemist. <laughs> Who's an un- chemist? Yep. <laughs> Pretty much. Back, I'm scientist <laughs> chemist. <laughs> Yeah, I've literally never heard anyone introduce themselves in any serious way as I'm a scientist. You know, and his uh, credentials are so dodgy as well. I mean, he did what? He did chemistry at undergrad level, then came out, did a year's chemistry in industry somewhere, and now, now he's an auto mechanic, and he thinks he understands the intricacies of biochemistry. Uh, biochemistry, biology, and all those sort of things. Because you know, I did a degree in chemistry. That means I can. That means it's a science degree. That means I can science on everything. Oh, that's kind of hurtful. Why are you slagging off chemists? <laughs> Jesus. It's he's not, not really a real science anyway. You he's know. not really. Well, he's not really real uh, chemistry. <laughs> I'm not having biologists tell me. <laughs> no, no, I'm kidding. Uh, Sorry. Well, I'm a biochemist <laughs> somewhere in there. I'm a. I'm a weird kind of field. Uh, but I don't know. A chem- chemists, chemists are okay. It's those engineers that I'm. It's Cal around. <laughs> I, always, I always think chemistry though is the the one difficult one to talk to people about because it's essentially glorified cooking. So, whereas <laughs> biologists can talk about interesting cells doing all sorts, physics guys can talk about loads of interesting yeah stuff about, about the universe. Chemists are like, well, I can make one white powder turn into another white white powder. Um, yeah, I don't know. Especially well, if you're organic chemistry. It's the drugs trade, isn't it? That's what you've got. <laughs> you're a chemist. I, I have often thought, uh, if this whole chemistry thing goes tits up for me, I can always make meth. So there's always that. <laughs> uh, I, I'm already living the dream. I mean, I've said too much. <laughs> <laughs> I have, I, Your Honour, I, no, I have no meth lab here. Kitch disappears to snort something off the counter quickly. I uh, I just have a cold. It's cold <laughs> here. I have no heater. So go and tell me more about this chemist guy. What, what does he What does he say? What does he talk about? Typical creationist bullcrap. But he uses he actually wears the lab coat at the actual seminar. Oh no, that that's right. That's one. That, that's that's a red flag for anyone out there. If anyone wears a lab coat and they're not in a lab then you should ignore what they're saying. And if they're not, this is another one as well, if they're on the TV and they're in a lab and they're not wearing a lab coat, it usually means they're really high up. So those yeah. are the two things, but otherwise, just don't listen to them. I mean, why do yeah. you need to You don't. In fact, don't it's, in fact, you don't do that. It's like, 
uh, safety 101 to keep all your stuff within contained areas. Yeah, but well, if you're not wearing got... a lab coat, how do we not? How do we know you're sciencing? Because you introduce yourself as Doctor Scientist Chemist. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. In fact, I've been yelled at many a time for actually wearing my. Uh, well, it was more over somewhere else for wearing my lab coat outside because you kind of get used to it. But um, yeah, no, I. That's um, that's just. It's almost. It's so sad that's actually. I actually thought he was a parody. Oh. Just when as soon as I saw the lab coat, I was thinking, really, you're trying too hard. But he doesn't help himself because he goes on about UFOs and in one with, um, is it Charles Barr or Carl Barr? He goes on about an expedition that he's planned that nobody's heard anything about since, where he was trying to find a live pterosaur. <laughs> Some <laughs> South America. Oh, wow. Okay. And apparently, people have been known to die from pterosaur breath. Oh, <laughs> good to know. I, I want to I've, see I've that no autopsy idea. report. I have no idea how to respond to that. <laughs> um, actually, there's actually another. Actually, bringing up him actually reminds me of another pseudo scientist that uh, you guys may be aware of. Actually, uh, yeah, uh, Mike Adams. Oh, I love uh, it. Yep, uh, good old Mike. He's amazing. Uh, he first, well, he was on my radar for a bit, but when he really came on my radar was when he was saying that the government was putting sarin uh, 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 toxin, uh, nerve gas, whatever, into the water supplied fluorinator. And that's when I was like, wow, you guy, you're a legend. And then, of course, uh, his rap at the end of Seeds of Death, which is amazing. What a legend. Yeah. And I'll, that's actually one of the reasons why I'm trying to push towards uh, us doing a live ponage of that video uh, sometime this year, just so I can just experience that live and to get everyone's reaction to that because I think that's both a, a, a weird combination of cringeworthy but epic at the same time. It's a weird it, sort of thing. It, it made that movie go from like a one out of five to a five out of five. It's it's amazing. If anyone's not seen it, then you you should totally watch it. It's it's epic. I think there should be more rap videos at the end of anti-science uh, documentaries. Certainly make them more interesting. Mm. I loved uh, your podcast, by the way, uh, about the music in certain um, uh, things. I think it was 9-11. They have like a music scene. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, that, that was quite a fun podcast. To do, actually. <laughs> uh, have you heard of the Chemtrails music scene? Uh, that's the one that's really, really quite big. The 9-11 one's all right. I've heard of it before, but the uh, Chemtrail one it has have got music videos and everything. It's really quite professional. It's really strange. Um, I have to check that out, actually. I have to not check it out. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know what you're missing. But, uh, but uh, actually, just about Mike Adams, he actually, do you know he actually has, or has claims to have his own lab? where he tests uh, different foods. He actually claims to have bought a mass spec. I, I, I could just imagine him putting like a sandwich into a mass spec and hoping to get back something. <laughs> uh, uh, what does he plan to do with an MS? Uh, I think he's looking to detect different... I think it was metals. I think he was looking for heavy metals in food. I can't remember which one, just off the top of my head. Kyle will be more... In who would be more up to date with Mike Adams? Because I generally, since um, I think I think it was halfway last year, I've kind of avoided him just for my own mental health. Because uh, there are some topics that just make me go absolutely furious. Like what? Actually, funny enough, actually, yeah, uh, yeah, I've tried to actually do a video response to his webinar series on uh, on YouTube about Ebola. I got halfway through, I was already sweating with rage because you can imagine what he was saying, don't go to the doctors, the doctors are trying to kill you, that mm. is kind of typical stuff. Um, I was just, and I was just, I was working my way to it, next thing, computer went, just, my computer just, just uh, crashed, which I assume was from the idiocy, but I, I took <laughs> it at a sign that, Michael, just, 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 uh, just don't. It's give it give it a give it a break. I, I it's really awful though, isn't it, that all these people have jumped on the 
crazy Ebola bandwagon. I mean, um, I think the Daily Mail published something in December about homeopaths going there, and uh, it, it, it presented them in a positive light. Did you guys read that? Uh, that one I had in there. It might have been the mirror, I can't remember. One of them, yeah, it was going on about uh, these four homeopaths that came from all over the world, and all they wanted to do was treat Ebola, and how the World Health Organization said uh, they're not allowed. And it was almost preaching, it was almost saying that these people were doing good. And it's like, oh, Jesus Christ. Uh, I... Yeah, but if this is the Daily Mail, you know, they... they... You can say homeopathy is for well, treatment for Ebola now, uh, technically. <laughs> so yeah, keep the system flushed. Yeah, but yeah. I, I hear as well. I um, I've got a particular be under my bonnet under. Uh, uh, I keep saying that uh, be under my bonnet uh, for a guy called Robert Scott Bell, and he's done a thing on Ebola as well. Uh, and his his sounds exactly the same to what Mike Adams is saying. Don't go to the doctors. You can treat it with antioxidants and crap like that i mean luckily like this there's, there's, there's not going to be hardly anyone in america who's got a bowl or anything like that it's it's really quite difficult to catch uh the problem comes when you know now with the, the age of the internet that kind of information can leach over to west africa and then you have lots of problems i mean i know uh, uh you guys talked about it before in trolling with logic there was the blog post that was two nutter butters even for natural news the guy who's saying that you should make your own ebola homeopathic solution uh. that is terrifying looking crazy yeah that that, that 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 i remember coming across that post and i was just i i i had no idea it, t it just took a f it just takes a very special mind to be able to think that's a cure for ebola is basically um you know infecting people with ebola that's so that's that's where that was going to end up and it's not like the f and also yeah it, it's, it's a very real possibility that uh this stuff can will get over to the affected areas you know Sierra, Sierra Leone and you know those places already have enough trouble trouble with the the mistrust of um the uh the, the you know with the um medical yeah, I mean, a, a lot of people presumed that it was uh, Western people coming over and infecting them. In fact, there was in November, October, there was one of the clinics was raided and they actually took people in blankets that were covered in blood out, and that was a, a serious, serious problem. Yeah, I actually, I actually haven't heard that. I've, I actually didn't actually hear that, but that that's that's you know awful, mm. and that's why you know it's important to to try and get out accurate information and to dispel the misinformation that's going out there because people are going to act on this uh that uh, on this information and that's also probably one of the responses actually to the questions is what is the harm you know when when it comes to I'm sure you get it and I'm sure Martimer and myself get myself get it as well is actually what is the harm of the pseudoscience that you are debunking, why can't you just la let them have their little, their little um, parade? Or why can't we let them believe what they want to believe? Yeah, exactly. Hmm. Is that people are going to act out on this information? And in the case of Africa, as you mentioned there, you know people aren't going to get get treatment. People are going to do things that are going to help the disease spread. And with a disease like Ebola, you know that's. That can be very, very dangerous, and also. I think, uh, sorry, I keep interrupting you. So no, no problems. Uh, sorry, I'm just kind of trying to fill in the dead space. I was going to say, I think a main problem with these people producing stuff is that they think that there's not going to be anyone at the other end of the line, uh, or if they do, they think it's just going to be people who need them that are going to buy their products. They don't think that it has the potential of doing real harm. Um, I, 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 well, maybe I just want to believe that is what I'm saying. I can't believe that some of these people can be so. Uh, I don't want to say evil, uh, but careless. Dangerous. Careless. Oh, yeah. um, I don't know. It just winds me up. Sorry, I'm, I'm mumbling. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Uh, I'm, I'm probably going to be doing that for the for this whole show. But um, yeah, it's. Uh, but like, there are people there out there that genuinely, probably gen do genuinely believe in what they actually promote, such as uh, spirit science, or um, 
I think I, I don't know if he believes it himself. I don't think he cares if he believes it or not. How come? Well, well he he just it, it's like uh, he he's promoting so many things that are uh, mutually contradictive. Uh -huh. So he's contradicting himself. Like, yeah, like like in in his first video, he says that. He's kids are starving in Africa because of the Western world uh, keeping resources away from them. Yep. You can't believe both those things. So, do you think, like this guy in the comment section here says, that he's doing it to make uh, money? No, I don't really think so. I th I think he just... I, I think Van to him it doesn't matter if it's true. Because all that matters to him is that it, uh, it feels nice. Uh, I think also that it promotes the him. Of, of the truth is completely irrelevant to him, I think. I, th I think I know what you mean. It's more, it's, he's saying it because it feels good to him and that it's, uh, it gives him a nice feeling. It gives him a fuzzy feeling. Yeah. Mm. I've not watched that. Sorry, I keep interrupting you again. I'm going to stop it. <laughs> no worries. Uh, I've only watched a few Spirit Sciences so far. They're like a fucking hour each. Um, do you think there's real harm in them? Because if he's saying, oh, it's the Western world uh, getting down Africa, is that really going to do... That's just rambling. In the ones I've seen so far, it's it's just words that he's throwing there. It doesn't seem to be anything too bad. I mean, you've done... <laughs> I mean, you've made well, a whole video series on him, haven't you? So, uh, uh, do you think there's real danger behind what he's uh, saying? The stuff about um, uh, medical advice. Oh, I haven't seen any of that yet. No, uh, he, um, he he's basically... Um, he's saying things like, okay, if you feel depressed, if you have anger issues, uh, you should just meditate. Oh. Don't go see a shrink. I mean, it does, uh, that's, doesn't that, he also that's put down and children as things that are are a bad influence on our lives that we need some kind of no, we need to redress the balance from uh, or something? No, that that was also about the meditation thing. Like, whatever your problems are, just meditate and, and that'll take care of it. Don't actually address the problem. And among the problems, he lists children. Yeah. Uh, what you so, mean, children with problems or children? I don't. Problem? I don't think he means that children are a problem. I think he means like the, the problems that your children might have. Uh, oh. Uh, don't Damn. don't address those problems because. Uh, I I think the idea is this sort of pseudo Buddhist. Your desire to not have problems is the source of your problems, or something like that. So just be okay with problems, and you won't have any. Because they're fantastic, aren't they? Really, for YouTube. Yeah, I mean, I mean, he, he, the work he puts in, uh, a yeah. lot of people will say that, you know, yeah, well, it's just a few hours in Flash, uh, and yeah, but there's artistic talent behind it. Oh, I forgot. Uh, I, was, I was actually watching, listening to one of your podcasts again today uh, as a bit of prep for this. Uh, you did briefly talk about it. I remember this now. And you talked about the Smiths. Uh, yeah. They're amazing. Have you seen some of the tweets that they put out? They're absolutely... I, I've uh, they're... read about... <laughs> a lot of it I, uh, do you not think if you're Will Smith you probably take away the phone from your kids and just say listen you'll thank me when you're older because this is going to be with you for quite a while I, I think uh, his money has gone to his head I think he just I don't know but, but, but some see. of the stuff he was saying that you don't need school or people would be better off if there was no school or Something like that. Well, yes, school yeah. isn't true because it ends. <laughs> and if babies could talk, they'd be the most intelligent thing in the universe. Ah. Uh, like the... And the time doesn't exist because you can perceive it 
uh, at different rates depending on if you're having fun or not. <laughs> I, 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 I think that but, he but that, is... I, I, actually, I actually contemplated making a video addressing one of their uh, their interviews, but then it just sort of reminded on, it dawned on me that they're 16 and 14, I think. Yeah, and, I, yeah, no, that, no, they're kids, aren't they? Yeah, I think yeah, that one is actually... I think that one's actually going up to him saying, okay, defend that. You know, I know as a kid, if I said something stupid to my parents, they'd be asking... Okay, what the fuck have you just said? You know, the kids—they're gonna say stupid crap because you know they—they—they they, they don't have the life experience. They actually haven't done any to study. They're still going through school. But Smiths, you know, I don't think anyone is there to actually say, no, you're wrong, or try to <coughs> give them critical feedback on, what they, on some of their ideas and that I, they have. I think a lot of that has to do with the fact they've grown up in an environment where they—they they have everything. Yeah. When you okay. have everything, you don't have to think. You don't have to be intelligent. Uh, case in point, Paris Hilton. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's the same thing. Especially when you grow up in an environment that's filled with sycophancy, which, you know, yeah. is going to be a lot of their environment in Hollywood anyway. Mm-hmm. You could say, uh, yeah, the lack of uh, telling them when something's crap. I mean, how else do you explain After Earth? Oh my god, terrible, terrible <laughs> film. <laughs> And also, uh, I don't know about you guys, but I am so grateful that the internet wasn't around like it is now when I was younger, because Minnie Miles was a right dick, and <laughs> like, I would hate for any of that crap to still be around right now, and my stupid haircuts and all the rest of it. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I, I, I understand what you mean, like, these are just kids, but that's why I think Will Smith should take their fun away from them and be like, listen, you know, you're going to regret this, you've hmm. been a silly teenager. Yeah. Yeah. Um. But that, 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 I just couldn't believe some of the stuff they were that they were coming out with, and I'm just I can imagine the look at the guy who's there managing their PR. He's probably just he's probably in the hospital right now, just recovering from the stroke he had. <laughs> just imagine. I wouldn't be so sure. I, I think. Uh, oh wait, I mean, was that a joke? Is it, it gets okay. attention. No, that was actually a joke. Sorry. Yeah, just I just for a second thought, fuck, is he just had a stroke, and I'm like laughing at that. <laughs> Uh, no, I, I won't be that evil. <laughs> yes. So, what are your guys uh, going through? You all, what's your one beef that annoys you the most? Then uh, I've talked about my, uh, mine. Definitely has to be the AIDS nihilist. But to go through you all, what's the one thing that really just gets on your tits? Oh, I would... general science denial. It doesn't really matter which uh, specific. Uh, subject we're talking about just the fact that people seem to be uh, mistrusting science and re they refuse to learn about it they, they don't want to understand it mm. uh, for me I think I think this is cheating because it's kind of con I think it's kind of uh, encompassing a lot of different ones, but I've, I'm not sure how to set, phrase it. I think it'd be, the best way to phrase would be the new age medicine movement. You know, where they kind of are pretty much like germ theory denialists, AIDS denialists, um, anti-vaxxers, that kind of crowd. You know, those that really argue against kind of, you know, the... Uh, bad medical science bingo they, they check all the boxes though those kind of people really just get under my skin they were they're just i think they're the most dangerous and that's why they really are the the bee in my body on that one and um and some sections the anti-gmo movement i mean the obnoxious kind of sex segment but that's just because they're obnoxious <laughs> no, no, that, 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 no i mean the obnoxious ones not just anti-GMO in general because some of them are actually quite friendly I found oh, I found that I, I've, I've talked to a fair few of them people, well people are lovely anyway I find like even, yeah. even the most batshit crazy people as long as you don't talk to yeah. them about all the batshit crazy stuff uh, yeah and, and what about you finally what's, what's your uh, uh, thing that annoys you um, well I, I guess I'm involved in a bit of environmental kind of activism and stuff and the thing that really annoys me is the amount of pseudoscience that creeps its way into that whole section um, and I guess society in, in the environmental activism movement you have a lot of these 
really strange anti-GMO views, anti-nuclear mm. views, that they kind of they take away from real environmental concerns. They they push the the discussion into this really unuseful area, and mm. and take it away from you know from what it what it actually should be about. And a lot of people involved in in the activist scene who don't really understand the science at all and mm -hmm. don't know what they're talking about so they end up coming out with something that's complete rubbish and it, it's a bit of a bugbear for me being semi-involved with that movement and yet seeing so many people who are you know voice yeah they're, they're kind of a, a mouthpiece for a lot of oh. movements coming out with just the most ridiculous inane rubbish that they you know get down to the bottom of it is stupid. I am I'm in an environmental science lab and my supervisors all the time every you think about that these people can we just ignore these people who are just I'm I'm trying to censor it down just so I know he he was on a couple of hours ago so I don't want to <laughs> Mm. Kind of um, painting with a bad bush, but yeah, no, that sort of that sort of that sort of stuff. Myself and uh, himself can get get into awful rants about just com just back and forth complaining about it, and uh, especially with stuff like bad science and anti-GMO, actually, is really bad because, for example, let's just take an example there. The a couple of years ago, there was the amount there was the I think it was a pro I can't remember. The, there was a proposition to in California. 37. 37, yes. The, I was there at the time. It was uh, all going on. Uh, oh, yeah. I, th I think I remember you... Did you do a video about that? Or am I... Uh, briefly. Yeah, it was an advert I did for it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah I remember that. And that was a, good, that was a really good one. And... Um, sorry, I don't mean to be kissing our yeah. on, the, on, the, right. on the screen. Um, but the... I basically read with you where the anti-GMO people... I. I t I, it's my opinion that the anti, you know, the anti-GMO people had done such a did such a bad job at the science and relaying what the science is like and giving themselves a bad name that this proposition didn't pass and it was a it was a decent proposition to you know Actually, label that. The more I read about it, the more it was a bit dodgy. Uh, it wasn't just the uh, the labeling of genetically modified mm. food. It went even further into kind of pushing other stuff uh, forward, and that's oh. where. It, yeah, like, because I, I didn't read that much into it. I was just basically, right, this is, you know, labeling food. That was the main thing in my video. I'm fine with that. Uh, but yeah, it turns out it was a, it was a lot more than that. Yeah, um, I didn't know. I, mind you, it's not my country, so, yeah. And I was over here, just, I can't remember actually where I was at that point. I, was at, I think it was at my final year at that stage. Um, but, but yeah, but, um, you know, the anti TMO people, uh, they're, they're, they're giving themselves such a bad name when they're quoting papers like the Serlani paper or even just going off the walls with siding, you know, getting people like Mike Adams involved or, well, I don't, but I don't want to say, you know, the anti-GMO crowd is quite a big, I don't think, I don't think most of them when you put up with Mike Adams, but, you know, these are the kind of people they, they, they that, you know, are coming out and that, that, that are, that are seen. The worst thing about them, I think, is that the majority of them aren't just fighting it against um, GMO food. They're fighting GM technology as a whole. So as a microbiologist, yeah. I'm guessing yeah. that you've done a, a lot of that. And uh, one of the best things, that I haven't, we haven't published it yet, though, uh, me and um, a friend James went to a March Against Monsanto uh, protest, and he's talking to someone on camera, and he's like, okay, what do you want? And they said they're against GMOs. And he's like, okay, well, I'm a scientist. You will put me out of a job. I'm doing X, Y, and Z that has the potential of doing blah, 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 blah. Do you want to stop me? And these people are just absolutely taken back, you know, because they, they don't think. Uh, it, I, one thing I was amazed uh, when I talked to these people is the lack of knowledge they had. And I don't mean that in a, a really big headed, arsy kind of way. I mean, these people honestly didn't know why they were there. They heard that GMOs were nasty and dangerous and they didn't like the companies. And they've seen pictures like in the Seralini paper and they've seen all these kind of like. Um, uh, fake paper. I'm gonna say, yeah, they are fake papers. They're they're not real. Uh, mm. Coming out, and they were they they were quite scared. I mean, they, uh, and that's the thing. They 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 weren't bad people. They they were doing something that they thought was right, but they were so uninformed. Yeah. And, oh, and Michael, there's something here that might really annoy you. Uh, there's a comment here that says that someone went to a cancer support seminar with his mum, 
and she, they said there was a, a lot of woo on display there, and it was terrifying. That, um, that's awful, that, when you think about it. Yeah, especially when it's a cancer support seminar. Yeah. That's, they said, this is literally, like, it's not just on YouTuber, you know, where it's just, you know, you're not really going to be thinking you're more, I'd say that's more careless. This here is, at a cancer support seminar, is just, I don't want to stop, it's just bad. You know, it's absolutely disgraceful. It's almost like vultures, really, isn't it? It's, that's a horrible analogy. Just like preying on, no, that's a terrible analogy. Take that back. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, is it that bad an analogy? I don't think so. <laughs> Maybe not. But um, it's, 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 a, it's an absolutely terrible thing, and especially... And I will even step that up because I wasn't too sure if they were just there. Oh, this is what we believe, uh, blah blah blah. But they were actually selling. But I assume probably they were. They're selling books and pills and all that kind of things. So probably that, that seems to go hand in hand. One that That's I don't evil. Get is ozone therapy. Have you heard of that before? I no. have never heard of that. <laughs> yes. I, is that where you breathe in pure oxygen or something? No, no, no. O, ozone, so O3. Uh, oh right. So. That sounds uh, like a pretty stupid idea. Yeah, uh, I was say that's poisonous, isn't it? Yeah, you'd undergo uh, ozonolysis, which is breaking of carbon-carbon double bonds, so it just dissolve you. And they recommend this to uh, people with lung cancer, <laughs> and you're like, "Wow, that is a chemist. that is a very, very just for the record, that is a very, very bad idea." <laughs> I, I know, that. like uh, ozone buggers over all sorts. Uh, so, it's unbelievable. You can get ozone chambers. What's really awful, if you look on YouTube, there's actually a video of a guy trying it when he had when he had cancer. Well, I think I I didn't watch until the end. So it's it's just yeah, it's awful. Yeah, that's that's gonna absolutely destroy the lungs. You know, well, there's, there's a one there's a one key in cancer therapy is try not to kill your patient. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to know. That's probably that's uh, probably the, the golden rule. Is um, it's alright if it kills the cancer cells, but if it kills you, what's the point? There's a group I found the internet once who were um, people that thought drinking hydrogen peroxide was good, and their their thinking behind it seemed to be that H2O, you know, it's got oxygen. Yeah, an extra H2O2 oxygen. H2O2 got more <laughs> oxygen. That must be that must mean it's good. And they they had no idea of what chemical bonds are and what happens when you add another oxygen atom to that chemical bond, how it changes the chemistry of yeah. the molecule. Have they not seen that cartoon where it's a chemist and his friend go to the pub and he goes, I'll have a H2O and the other one goes, I'll have a H2O2. <laughs> <And he dies. laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah that, that was, uh, I was just uh, thinking that one there. That was, uh, but yeah, that's, there, there's an awful lot of wacky uh, cancer treatments out there. I know there's one actually done by a guy, well, it was Kent Hoven, but the first time I came up across this uh, particular treatment was to eye to eye. Uh, if I'm not too sure if you guys remember this particular person, but um, he said that the vitamin, I think it was vitamin B17 in the pits, in the seeds of, I think it was almonds or pears or apricots, oh, I can't yeah. remember. Peaches. Peaches, that was it, that could cure cancer, but when you actually look at it, the only thing you're probably likely to get is cyanide poisoning. If you eat yeah. enough of them, that's still going to this day. People will take all sorts. Uh, 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 yeah, like it just uh, bumps up the cyanide in their system. Not good. That, 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 that one's a particular. That was that one was a particular bee. That was that. Sorry, I'm following you on that one. Uh, that one was just a particular annoying me. That was a very annoying for me for to, to kind of address that kind of thing, especially when oh, it came that's from. The reason I didn't like peaches. <laughs> the extra cyanide. <laughs> uh, uh, Mortimer, is it? Wait, is your name? Is it Mortimer? Am I saying that right? Uh, Mortimer. What? Mortimer. Mortimer. Sorry about that. Yeah, I, something I, I went to that I think you might like. I went to a new age uh, hippie uh, get together meeting thing that was a, like a hotel near me, and I went to um, a talk that they gave. And this woman with a straight face, you, I think you'll like this. She was advertising uh, smells that she made. Uh, wait, said that wrong. <laughs> she was. <she> made, <laughs> Uh, she made like a load of sense, um, 
and she was saying it's for different things. Uh, you know, if you're feeling angry, you, you spray this, it's got gold in it, and you know, you waft yourself and you'll feel stronger. And she says, oh, it's because it actually changes the DNA of you. <laughs> and I was there just like, don't laugh, don't laugh. They'll, they'll, know, they'll, you'll know, they'll know you're not one of them. <laughs> don't laugh. Uh, and then I had to, I had to stop my from putting it down. Do you reckon I can commit a murder and then get some of this spray? <laughs> no, don't, don't ask her that. <laughs> that, that, uh, that it's is... one thing that's intrigued me is I, I work a lot during the festivals, and um, you have these places at most of the festivals in the UK, they call them the healing fields. And it's full of like homeopaths, chiropractors, all these kind of weird little things. And one thing I've found is if you actually ever do need anything actually healing when you're at a festival, the last place you want to be is at the healing fields, ironically. Because... You just don't get healed. <laughs> you know, I've cut my finger open. Well, let's do a little bit of homeopathy on it. Oh, okay. I think it was there a holy shrine. I can't remember. Was it Lourdes? Sorry, I'm just kind of just kind of get this back to the back of my head. But where they found um, that they, there was anti, anti sorry antibiotic resistant bacteria in the water. Not sure. So, so I'm just I'm just I remember actually coming across this actually just this morning on on uh, was shared to me on Twitter. From, I think it was New Scientist, but. Actually, funny enough, actually, a, a, few, a past guest of ours actually was um, was uh, actually was pretty much in India. The shrine. I can't remember the actual name. Sorry, I'm just awful of the names at the moment. There's a shrine in India, and that it was li it was basically it was crying. It was one of these crying streets, um statues of Mary and people were rubbing up against it, drinking the water, believing it gave them, you know, cured them. Anyway, he came in and did, they was challenged, you know, he was a bit of a skeptic, you know, a bit of a famous skeptic in India and he was challenged to find the source. And he found out that one of the pipes from the, to uh, from the sewage system was leaking into the, into, the Mary, into the Mary statue and that the people were actually drinking sewage water. Oh, nice. So, and I think he, I think it was for that that they pretty much kind of chased him, chased him off. But that was one of the past shows. I think it was two years ago now, actually. That 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 one particular story has stuck in my head ever ever since. But yeah, it's, uh, someone said that it's like the Simpsons episode where uh, you know Maud um, there's the gas leak and the mask kind of floats up and it, and they figure out what it is. Yeah. But the. But that, that as far as I know that those kind of things are pretty. Sorry, I'm just not getting along without my coffee today. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, no, just uh, having withdrawal symptoms at the moment. <laughs> Fairly slowly getting withdrawal symptoms. Um, He's still recovering from New Year. Yep, that too. <laughs> <laughs> that was one crazy night. But um, the we've gone on to. Oh, I wanted to ask a quick question, yeah. if yeah. I could, of Miles. Um, just on your HIV denialist. Um, series that you did on House of Numbers. Yeah. You brought up the Foo Fighters who did the benefit gig. Yeah. Um have they said anything about that? Have they retracted it? Have they I, or are they still adamant that they did the right thing? I've I've I at the time I tried uh, my hardest to actually find uh, what happened and all I managed to find was that they uh just simply removed it from their website. Uh, I don't think they've made a public apology. I've, I, I read a few blogs um, and articles in, in papers that have been put online that said that uh, the, you know the gay community is in San Francisco is really quite angry with them, and uh, how could they not put a retraction up? So I I, I don't think they've done anything. I might be wrong, uh, but because this was like over a year ago that I actually looked it up. Um, but unless they've done things since then, I couldn't find anything. I mean, you'd think something like that. Would be massive and glaring on their website. Like, hey, fuck it. We're sorry. We're wrong about this. You know, uh, we've might, we've caused probably a lot of uh, damage. Uh, but it, it just it's not that. Mm. Just a slow backpedal, but 
they probably still do, but I would say just taking out that, though, I'm not Amsu Mind Reader, so uh, I'm only uh, speculating that they still do in some way accept that, but it's just such a backlash that they decided to just quietly remove it. I I don't know. I, I, it would just be me speculating. Yeah, no, that's, I, I, I that's, guess maybe the death of uh, Christine and her daughter maybe brought it home to them. Um, who knows? It's, it's, yeah. it's uh, sad the way that sometimes that well, it almost what needs to take with some people that it takes them to per it takes it to, for them to personally affect to be affected by it. Well, I, I, for it to sink I, home. I, I think that happens all the time. Uh, not personally close, personally, but like within close uh, proximity. I mean, again, going back to 2013 when we had the the measles scare, uh, it, it's a result of people getting ill. And to be honest with you, I don't think most of the thing most of these things are going to go away until we see another measles mumps rubella outbreak until we see uh polio possibly even though polio is pretty much out now but like <laughs> if we ever saw something like that coming back again in in like the western world that that's when people will get vaccinated because right now you know we all live in a pretty good part of the world where we don't have to worry about smallpox and crap like that anymore so you know it, it doesn't seem it, I, I guess living in this world it, it seems more of a, to risk to some people to get the vaccine than it does from the problems that they don't normally see day to day. Uh, mm. So yeah, I think I think I I can. It's not pessimistic view. I just think it it comes from a view of um, yeah, just more people are going to get hurt before it gets better. I think that's also for uh, other sciences like climate change. Uh, people aren't going to start accepting that until they start actually being. They actually start being really affected by it. I think. Of a service, a quote. Uh, it will take it. That's, no, sorry, it's all over the place. But um, actually, there was a question I wanted to ask, and that you know, for during your your series on the AIDS denialist movie, you were you know you you received several DMCA's. I was think, as far as I can tell, with the HIV crowd, that they seem to be the most um, they seem to be the most they tend to go after you the most or they tend to almost bully to, in order uh, to silence the people that, uh, that are critical against them more than I'd say spirit science or or any other form do you find that it's, do you think that's the case or it's well um, I, I think there was definitely there was a little bit of orchestration around those people where you don't really get that with the other things and I guess it's more. I, th I think it more comes from AIDS denialism being under the radar for so long that they haven't had people being critical of them on YouTube and, and places like that because uh, people haven't heard of it. So when I came along, was like, "Your movie fucking sucks." So do you? Uh, they took real offence to it. It didn't help that you know to be part of this um, little group. You know, you you either have to be very unwell and denial in denial, or a few of the place a few good things as well but also it attracts the absolute nutters it attracts the liam chefs the brent leons and uh they are a few cabbages short of an allotment uh so they all just came after me it, it was it was actually um it wasn't very nice but unfortunately what I've, I've seen recently is this tactic of going after the person this almost social social justice kind of thing seems to be almost commonplace on the internet no matter what side you're on so I, I think it's it could even come from I think maybe it could have came from just really the times that it's become more acceptable to DMCA someone to go after them uh, professionally. Uh, but I, I honestly don't know. They were very they were very vocal about how much they hated me though. <laughs> they, they flipping hated me. Yeah. Uh, that's that's just generally that actually remind me of back. I think it was a few years before that. Uh, I think it was 2000, 2010 and around that there was actually the big problem in DMCA was now it was more with creationism, and that you had other big YouTubers being DMCA mm. left, right, and center. You know, the famous Venom Fang X. Um, for those who, internet veterans who <laughs> remember him uh, going that, around. It was a little bit different though with me uh, and. With the creationists and stuff, it just tend to be one silly Canadian boy in his room filing all these DMCA's. But with me, it was like a massive company. They they said they owned the property and they were properly coming after me. I mean, I know, you know, what I think would be brilliant, and this is what EFF 
uh, are thinking of, uh, of trying to pass legislation, trying to get legislation passed, is that if you file a false DMCA, there will be a set fine. And if that were to happen, then all the DMCA's would disappear almost overnight. Because um, even big companies won't risk like five grand a pop. Uh, <laughs> and you can imagine the businesses would come out of that. Say like uh, you just have lawyers jumping at you saying, "Hey, you know what? I'll take ten percent, and uh, we'll sue this bastard because they filed a false DMCA." Uh, so if that happens, it's going to be fantastic. It, it's going to mean that the internet's DMCA problem is going to be gone. I mean, at the moment, I have two DMCA's against me uh, right now from some lunatic uh, who thinks that I can't use images uh, and uh, can't use images and, and say they're under fair use from a book that also says they're under fair <laughs> use. Uh, so yeah, as soon as that comes, that's gonna be fantastic. And the great thing about it as well is the EFF are looking to say, hey, we're gonna make sure so it's gonna be backdated. So it means all these people that have uh, filed them in the past against me, I can just go after them, uh, which would be brilliant. And I, mm. I, I honestly think that's gonna help because the DMCA at the moment is broke. It's it, it, I mean, it's I an honor system, isn't it? Really, Sorry? it's an honor-based system. Uh, you know, you file it under um, under good faith. Yeah, is it that, is that the current but system? The, pro the problem is though that it, it's a way of getting information from the other party, though. And if you deal with the kind of people I've dealt with in the past, I don't want to give them my personal information. I mean, look what happened. Yeah, in February when they contacted my employer and they posted my stuff all over the place. You know, that's these aren't very nice people. This isn't like a nice. A uh, gentlemanly, gentlemanly agreement in the pub between two people. No, no, no. The, usually, usually, these people who wield it um, are nutters. And the worst thing about it is, well, um, it says that you know the DMCA is filed into perjury and all that kind of stuff. But if I were to take any of these people to court, I could only sue them for um, the cost it would it would take for me to go to court and my losses. But as I don't make any money on these videos and therefore protected under fair use, they haven't really got that much to lose. Whereas I would have quite a lot to lose in taking them to court. So it's it's almost this circular uh, mm. thing that's just going to protect people like Liam Sheff and Larry Cook and all the rest of them. Yeah, it's 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 definitely it's a different it's a system that definitely needs uh, improvement, and that's actually yeah. can be used, and it's actually as you said, it could be used for intimidation for people who may not be so willing or to to give their personal information who may not be in the situation to. Right. It's, to it's do definitely so. used for intimidation, and you have companies that make a living off it. Uh, Psychic Sally's got another one who's been after me. She's DMCA'd me a few times. Uh, for those of people who don't know, uh, leaning over. Psychic Sally is a psychic from England uh, who I'm currently reading her book and it's as fantastic as you'd imagine. Uh, <laughs> uh, so she got a company called Web Sheriff to come after me and they, again, not very nice people, they, they, make, a, they, basically, they make a living out of censoring the internet and it's, it's pretty shitty, really. Mm. But like again, if, if, this, if this flat fee came in of five grand, that company would be wiped off the face of the planet within a day. Uh, and uh, especially, uh, it's not only just pseudoscientists, but it's also, as far as I'm aware of, actually creeping into the video game community with reviewer reviews of games mm -hmm. uh, being taken off because they're a bad review. Oh, so that, is that uh, a thing? Uh, yes, actually. Yeah. Uh, as, far, as far as I know, actually, one such example was, I think, Angry Joe, one of Angry Joe's videos was removed. He was actually given the press footage and explicitly used, oh, you can use this in your review. Next thing gave it a bad review next thing was taken down yeah that's just blatant censorship that, that sucks but yeah that's but if you if you had a, um, a flat fee um, or even an incremental fee that uh, the more copyright strike the more times you falsely file a DMCA against somebody the more you should probably pay hmm because I think that would probably be I think I think people would be surprised at how often companies do this. Uh, I mean, if I got these four years ago and I first started, I would back down straight away, you know. And it's just really shocking. I mean, these people are paid a hell of a lot, like web sheriffs out there, to almost yeah to censor stuff that they don't like. They they actually, I mean, they call themselves web sheriff. How fucked up is that when you think about it? That uh, yeah, that's that's and. Basically, it's no, they're at no loss. They are risking nothing. Yeah. Realistically, they're really in the, in the actual terms and conditions. They are 
technically they could be taken to court, but who's going to take? Who's going to? There's no. There's no one's going to take someone to court over a false DMCA, so they are risking nothing. So it's basically well, just apart, apart from the Streisand effect, it all goes tits up for them. Oh yeah, that's that's actually probably the best weapon at the moment that we that can stop people from doing DM, DMCA. But some people just don't know that don't know uh, know, know about it and just go and press on right ahead. Or especially, but it's but it's more. I find that that would be more. The strike sound effect isn't as helpful to maybe the the uh, lesser known YouTubers who may not have much of an audience at mm. the moment. So that's I think yeah. that the, the the flat fee coming in that that will do that will do them the world of. The world oh no, of I'm not saying it's coming in. I'm saying that's something that they're really pushing for. Uh, uh, sorry, I mean, if it if it does come in, that's what I mean. Mm. Sorry, I'm just there. Uh, Speaking. I find it quite weird, though, that and maybe I'm going a bit too extreme here, but that that censorship in in such a form isn't itself criminalised. I mean, you know, it's it's the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, for God's sake, is freedom of expression. But that and only exists people... in the, U, the U.S. Uh, you know, you could say that some of these countries and some of the people who act uh, on behalf of them are from countries where that isn't a thing. Yeah, but with the the internet being such a an almost U.S. institution, as it kind of sometimes feels, I find it odd that it's not trying to champion the you know the push against censorship in probably in a more extreme way, but at least in a more I suppose a more pragmatic way. You know, YouTube is just bending over backwards for people who file DMCA requests rather than actually pressing the point. Well, it's it's all automated, and they have such a volume that they they possibly couldn't do it. And also, they, I mean, it all stems from when Viacom tried to take them to court, wasn't it? Uh, and how they and how Viacom uploaded their footage to YouTube and then took them to court over it. Um, so I, I can see why YouTube's where YouTube comes from. I mean, I know people on YouTube. I've been there, and they're they're, they're lovely people. Um, but they really, they just want to protect their company and their interest. And the bottom line is, they don't really care that much. As awful as that sounds, they don't. I mean, uh, if you disappear or if you get a few DMCA's against you, if you have a channel of a hundred million, hundred thousand people, then even if you disappear the next day, that's just a blip on their screen. They, you wouldn't even register. So. Yeah. Hey, sorry, uh, just notice we're coming to the end of the actual show, so at oh. this point uh, I'd just like to mention two things. Uh, you can still donate to the experiment.com project page. The link is actually on chat right now it's, uh, in the description right below. Uh, at this point in time, I'd just like to ask, uh, just, uh, give Miles the, the floor to promote <laughs> anything he may be working on or... Uh, uh, the, or the podcast itself, uh, League of uh, Nerds. League of Nerds, yeah, with James. Um, yeah, I don't, well, I feel bad. I can't promote that in your podcast. That's uh, as cheeky as hell. But yeah, uh, I'm, on, uh, I'm on the internet. Come find me if you like me. Uh, and uh, if you, uh, sorry, just uh, if you have a link, you could just put into the chat there, uh, Miles. I'll put that uh, uh, for the podcast as well because you liked it. I think if I think if I do that, my internet will crash. So maybe later yeah. I'll do it. Your hand. Uh, we'll probably put it if this when this video goes up. We'll probably have it in the description somewhere. Cool. Well, no. Thanks for having me on, by the way. Cheers. Thanks for coming on. Um, so. Yeah, cheers, man. Th thanks for everyone who has contributed to so far, and uh, ha here's to uh, happy 2015 of podcasting. Right. Um.